Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming, especially in the rain. <laughs> Um, but I, as you probably already know, we have a really great event for tonight. Um, what we're doing tonight is listening uh, to Grady's presentation and we're going to have a panel afterward. And then we also have a book signing which Grady will sign, it's sale and sign, and some of the um, illustrators will also sign the books. Their illustrations are in the book. Um, so Grady is actually going to be in charge of the whole thing. <laughs> So he gets most of the work. I'm just going to introduce him. Um, and I met Grady a few months ago, and he's been just as fantastic, more fantastic than his book. Um, and I'm just really grateful that we stuck it out and we got you here. Um, so I'm going to read uh, about Grady. Um, Grady is an author and screenwriter, and he lives here in New York City. Um, his books include Horror Store about a haunted IKEA, which I can imagine. Um, my Best Friend's Exorcism and Paperbacks from Hell. He does a lot more. He's just keeping it short here. Um, Paperbacks from Hell has been selected as one of the Onions and Barnes and Noble's best books of the year. And you didn't write it, but it is also uh, Amazon's best of the year 2017 in the humor and entertainment list. So. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm just going to add this, that when we do have the panel, you can ask questions during the panel, okay? And uh, the mic will be over here on the side. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks, great. The first urban casualty of any consequence in Britain was in unnamed town of some 27,000 souls in the south of England, which was struck by a freak storm of a kind nobody had ever before encountered. The storm was freak because what the storm brought was not torrents of rain, but torrents of maggots. For this small family, the beginning came as it came for so many that morning on opening the front door of the small house in the quiet close formed by the little cul-de-sac at this tiny council estate on the far edge of town. Can't get the door open, Mommy. Can't open the door. The tiny childish voice sang back along the hall as the kilted, sweatered six-year-old tugged vainly at the big brass knob handle just only within her tiptoed reach. Carrie Carr came from the kitchen, fish slice in hand. Come away from the door, darling. Don't touch the door. We're going to have our breakfast now. Want to see the postman, mummy? Want to see the postman? Postman, 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 postman. Want to see the postman? The child gave an extra hard pull, and the door opened inwards without warning, sending her falling suddenly back. There was a brief silence, then a scream of mingled anguish, pain, and Patty pierced the morning air. Carrie stopped, frozen, unable to understand what she saw. It was not that she was incapable of comprehension, but simply that she refused to comprehend. The doorstep was hidden under a white mass of maggots. And stretching away from the doorstep, the front path was hidden under a layer of maggots. And outside the garden gate, the pavements and the roads were hidden under a mass of maggots. And the gate was covered in maggots. And the trees were covered in maggots. And the parked cars were covered in maggots. A mix of inch-long and half-inch maggots, as far as the eye could see, wriggling and writhing in an ever-moving, ever-milling mass. Pink, white, gray, yellow maggots moving like a vast tidal blanket. Up the gatepost, across fences, over hedges, along paths, they moved the maggots. In their unimagined countless millions and billions of zillions, maggots. Now, over the doorstep and into the house, they swarmed towards the child and her mother, maggots. <laughs> In 2010, I was at a convention, and I was rummaging through a dealer's box, and I found this. Um, I didn't know what it was or where it was from, but I knew one thing. It was beautiful. <laughs> I bought it for the cover, and I wasn't going to read it. I had no plans to open this book and actually let the words move into my brain. But as Jeffrey Dahmer once said, sometimes stuff just gets out of hand. Um, <laughs> And the little people turns out to be about a gorgeous secretary who inherits a castle in Ireland and turns it into a B&B. &B. That's it in the background. On opening weekend, it's crowded with guests, but some uninvited guests lurk in the basement. The Gestapo cons. These, it's important to realize, are not 
actual Nazi leprechauns. They are psychic homunculi created from fetuses surgically removed from Jewish concentration camp victims who are trained as S&M sex slaves for full stives Gestapo officers. Each of them has its own tiny six inch bullwhip. Their leader is named Adolf. The the secretary's boyfriend at one point tries to explain to her what exactly it is they have discovered. They're not animals, you see. They've got immortal souls, the same as we have. And that means they've got rights and privileges. They can vote once they're registered, of course. Uh, and they've got something to sell, not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They have themselves to sell. And all they need is really a good lawyer, a, a business manager, and a press agent. And they're in business with a million the first year and a steady income after. The money is just going to pour in from, a, from television, magazine articles, advertising, 100 pounds for opening a, a village fete. A thousand for their names on a breakfast cereal. And after that, they could teach themselves to play the guitar and form a pop group, the Stunted Seven. They, they would have to be small guitars, you understand. But they could do wonderful things with amplification these days, and if that's too difficult for them, they could just open and close their mouths to the rhythm and someone else can sing the music. Did I say a million? I meant a million each every year. Now, come on, you wouldn't want to stand between them and a future like that? This book raised a lot of questions. Questions that haunted my life. Where did it come from? Who made it? Were there more like it? And the answers turned out to be yes, there were more like it. Many more. As many more like it as there are Nazi leprechauns in a Nazi leprechaun hive. And that raised the biggest question of all. Where'd they go? So to answer these questions, I read close to 400 horror paperbacks from the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And I want to share with you the knowledge I'm bringing back because you shouldn't do that. Um, I, <laughs> I want you to come with me now for the next hour on a journey beyond time and space, beyond good taste. I want you to come with me on a little journey to the paperbacks from hell. In the beginning, there was nothing. Before 1967, the word horror didn't appear on book covers. It was not a marketing category in literature. Everything was either uh, it was eerie adventure or uh, suspenseful thrills or eerie chilling suspense adventure. Uh, the last horror novel that actually broke into the annual top 10 in book sales was Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, all the way back in 1940. And now it's the 60s. And pop culture always reflects what's around us and, and sort of the larger world. And suddenly you had Vietnam on TV every night. Every Everyone had front row seats for the assassination of JFK, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy. Police brutality sparked riots that left hundreds dead in Harlem, Watts, Detroit, Alabama. There were riots in Newark, Rochester, Michigan, Toledo, Flint, Houston, Tucson, Milwaukee, Portland, Minneapolis, just in 1967. America was on fire. And how did horror respond? With polite vampires in velvet capes. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde are bleeding out all over movie theater screens. You've got samurai movies showing in grindhouses, leaving amputated arms and legs all over the audience. You've got spaghetti westerns blasting blood squibs all over people in nihilistic orgies of violence. But horror movies were giant insects. Uh, they were musty hammer vampire movies. They were old Edgar Allan Poe period pieces. On television, horror was the monsters with its laugh track and dark shadows with its middle-aged actors bumping into the cardboard sets under the shadow of the boom mic. Mainstream publishing was breaking new ground. I mean, you had all these racy bestsellers, sexy spies, explicit sex and violence, Portnoy's complaint with its wanking, James Bond with his shagging, Valley of the Dolls with its pill popping, while horror fiction and actually all genre fiction was retreating into this pulp past. There had been a Burroughs boom in the 60s as bottom of the barrel paperback publishers discovered that Edgar Rice Burroughs' novels written around 1912 to 1917 had just fallen into the public domain. Lancer had recently licensed the Robert E. Howard Conan books written in the 30s. Bantam was republishing the Doc Savage novels from the 30s and 40s. And all of them had these beautiful, beautiful painted covers by James Bama and Frank Frazetta. But inside the covers, it was retrograde colonialist claptrap from 30 years in the past. And then everything changed. Between 1967 and 1971, they appeared. Hallelujah. The Holy Trinity. The Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, and Thomas Tryon's The Other. Everyone's like, oh, I know, what? Um, 
Rosemary's Baby came out in 67 and sold 6 million copies. In 68, it earned, the movie came out, it earned an Oscar, it was condemned by the Catholic Church, and it saved Paramount from bankruptcy, which is sort of like the trifecta. Uh, in June of 71, Thomas Tryon's The Other and William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist entered the New York Times bestseller list simultaneously, and for 11 weeks, they both hung in there at position one and position three, and then sort of the other slipped off after 24 weeks, and The Exorcist hung in there 56 weeks. It moved 4 million copies before William Friedkin made his movie, which became a cultural phenomena. It's since today it sold 14 million copies. The movie was the second highest grossing film of the year. It won two Academy Awards. And these three books, between 67 and 71, even today, this is where all modern horror comes from. They gave birth to everything we see now. Suddenly, horrors for adults, and all any adult wanted to talk about was Satan. You had Satan's slaves, Satan's assassins, uh, Satan's pets, Satan's love child, Satan's mistress, Satan's sublets. You sort of assume that Satan's sublets has a no Satan's pets policy. Um, you know, Satan was everywhere. The book could be a cozy mystery about antique dealers solving a murder in a small English village. It could be an alternate universe sci-fi novel, but it had to have Satan on the cover to sell. And every single book that came out got a blurb comparing it to either The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, or the other. If it was literary fiction by Bear Brainbridge or Angela Carter was more terrifying than The Exorcist, more horrifying than Rosemary's Baby. If it, was, if it was philosophical comedies, it was composed of the other, more chilling than Thomas Tryon's The Other. Satan had become publishing secret sauce, and publishers realized that the key to success was the mashup. So you got um, Rosemary's Baby plus uh, the Jim Fix Complete Guide to Running, and you wound up with The Glow, which is a book that's sort of a riff on Rosemary's Baby where a young couple moves into a building run by these old people who are not Satanists, they're health nut vegetarians who want them to uh, stop eating meat because it's gotten hormones in it, to drink more kale juice, and then when they're they want them to take up jogging too. And when their cholesterol gets low enough, when they have the titular glow, uh, the old people break into their apartment and suck all their blood so they can live forever. Uh, the Exorcist, plus black exploitation gives you the black exorcist, which was basically the exorcist, only a lot cooler. Um, and so black or white, high cholesterol or low, you know, Satan had become the all-purpose bad guy, which sort of leaves you wondering, I'm sure I can see it on your faces, who were the good guys? And um, I want to take a minute to talk now about the mirror scene, because in all of these books, at some point, the main character will catch their reflection in a mirror, walk by a plate glass window, see themselves in a puddle of beer on the bar, and they'll sort of muse over their looks, you know? And, and so from these, I was able to put together a, a profile of sort of the average horror protagonist of the 70s. And just so you can, you know, a little visual, there's a skeleton having a little uh, mirror moment. Um, so the horror man of the 70s is big, but not muscular. He's stocky and powerful and usually comes with a deep tan, although you have to remember, it's very important, while his skin may be mahogany or olive, he is Anglo-Saxon. Sometimes he may be Irish or Italian, in a few very weird cases he's Greek, but his skin is dark because he works outside doing hard, honest labor, not because he's ethnic. He is made of chisels. His profile is chiseled, his nose is chiseled, his forehead is chiseled, his chest is chiseled, his powerful forearms are chiseled. The only thing that is not chiseled are his eyes. Those are piercing and serious. However, they also light up and come playful and gentle when he smiles. Uh, the best way for him to show how much he cares for a woman is slow, passionate lovemaking when he makes her feel safe as if he's someone she can really, truly let her guard down with. The horror woman, on the other hand, has a willowy athletic figure and dynamite legs. Surprisingly, she is often flat-chested, although there are some notable exceptions. She comes in two flavors, either dreamy and artistic, in which case she's given to precognitive shivers, dreams, and a sense that something's wrong with this old lodge slash hospital slash remote mansion. Or she's practical and hard-headed, ready to sacrifice herself performing a dangerous ancient ritual to save the world. The most expressive part of her body are her nipples. Um, they noticeably harden in many situations, such as when she is aroused, surprised, meets new people, becomes confused, frightened, falls in love, hears a loud noise, encounters suspicious behaviors in others, or is cold. <laughs> they seem to be almost prehensile tentacles, capable of lengthening, thickening, unfurling, budding, flaring, unfolding, increasing, sweating, and swelling. If she is a nice woman, she has blonde hair. Maybe she's a brunette. If she likes sex too much, she is a redhead. Her eyes are almost always green, sometimes gray. The horror woman, believe it or not, is often employed. If she's married, she owns a fashionable boutique. If she's single, she's a gifted artist or 
an ambitious reporter. It is worth noting that the horror man is, an ambitious, is a reporter. He's inevitably a washed up alcoholic looking for a second chance. But if a horror woman is a reporter, she is too ambitious for her own good and looking for her first big break. No matter what her job, she is obsessed with proving herself to her male colleagues. And I have to say, reading all these horror paperbacks from the 70s, I started to feel sorry for women. Um, they have to put up with a lot of problems that men don't. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and I really, I felt a lot of empathy. You know, according to these books, they age terribly, and by the time they're 30, they're ready for their coffins. Um, if they eat anything other than a light salad, they immediately become a fat, uh, and no one wants to talk to them anymore. If they're not completely careful, every single second of the day, they have a baby. Uh, if they smile t if they smile too much, they're creepy. If they don't smile enough, they need to be shot with a tranquilizer dart and put in the zoo. And then there is the entire issue of down there. Um, I don't know, this is a delicate subject. Men have spent decades and billions of dollars developing devices to help women deal with their down there areas. But no matter what men do, and it's not through lack of trying, they can never fix what is probably the most dangerous female problem of all. The number one medical issue that is a threat to all living creatures, as bulky and dangerous as a nuclear bomb on a hair trigger, the female orgasm. Fortunately, John Coyne is on the job to track down the source of these deadly spasms, which turn out to be caused, as I always suspected, by UFOs. If anyone's going to know that UFOs were behind this, it's John Coyne. He was a longtime author of books like the Pentland School, Craft, uh, Pentland School Crafts Book of Pottery, but he was writing fiction, and he was getting really tired of this growing stack of unpublished novels. So one day, he sat down, studied The Exorcist very, very carefully, and delivered The Piercing, which is a carbon copy of a uh, Catholic thriller, uh, except instead of being about demonic possession, it's about stigmata. Coyne sold uh, The Piercing for a lot of money. It sold a lot of copies, and that really went to his head very quickly, causing him to say things like, I am the only horror novelist working the so-called religious themes, which, you know, was actually true if you didn't pay any attention to every single other horror novel being published at the time. But after the piercing had sold a few million copies in paperback, his publisher said, John, what else you got for us? And John Coyne said, the time has come for the searing. We begin in 1608 as a doe, which is a deer, a female deer, has an orgasm for no good reason and falls over dead, thus establishing that the female orgasm has been deadly to women of all species for at least 300 years. Cut to present day 1979 as Father Delp is forced to auction off his farm equipment because real estate developers have bought up all the farms outside Washington, D.C. and turned them into a fashionable suburban community called Renaissance Village. It's filled with hotshot D.C. types, doctors from the NIH, spies at the CIA, and women like Sarah, who have barely moved in when she has a spontaneous orgasm that makes her fall down. She gets up. It happens again she falls back down. I keep having these orgasms, she says, for no reason, you understand, without any sex or man around. When I'm alone, I'm suddenly hit by real, violent, powerful orgasms. What's happening to me? Even worse, these are the first orgasms Sarah has ever had. I'm 32. I had finally accepted the idea that I was one of those women who never would. 32. Just when she thought she was safe from the worst possible thing that can happen to a woman, even worse, sir, there are many causes of these evil orgasms. It could be the autistic farmer's daughter, Cindy Delp, who likes to hide in people's closets and jump out at them screaming. Maybe it's Kevin Volt, the CIA agent, who has a mysterious bank of microwave computer equipment hidden in his basement. And what about the old burial mound up behind Renaissance Village? I mean, as far as John Coyne and I, frankly, are concerned, anything could be causing these orgasms. We don't know. The orgasms get so bad that Sarah and the other women in Renaissance Village begin to get nosebleeds. Then the Volt's baby, has, uh, its brain explodes from a tiny baby orgasm. And then they find the dead body of a local teen up on the woods on top of the Indian burial mound. As the sensitive cop says to the victim's father who asks what happened to his daughter, you know how you can take a hammer to a Halloween jack-o'-lantern and smash in the hollow pumpkin with one blow? Yeah, that's what happened to your kid. Her brains were all over the fucking forest. 70s were a different time, different levels of sensitivity. <laughs> Finally, Sarah gets enough of a break between these orgasms to start piecing the pieces together. I'm just saying there might be a connection between these orgasms and these deaths, which kind of makes me think she might be a French philosophy student. She also realizes that young Cindy Delp isn't screaming because she's autistic. She's simply speaking at a speed three times faster than the human ear can comprehend. So using a tape recorder to slow down her screaming, they link her brainwaves to Kevin Volt's computer bank and learn that she's not even human. She's a remote data transmitter disguised as a 
a human for an extraterrestrial computer called the Eye of Bell that transmits and receives information through her brain from the very edge of the galaxy, and that ancient Indian burial mound is actually a primitive observatory built by a secret race of Celtic shaman who snuck over to America to worship UFOs 3,000 years ago. See, everything makes sense if you just stop having too many orgasms and think. But the Eye of Bell is really angry that its secrets have been uncovered, so it sends balls of light flying through Renaissance Village that cause even more women to have more orgasms, which actually cause their, brain, cause their brains to liquefy and run out their noses. I didn't know that was a risk. Uh, to stop this, Sarah has to give Cindy Delp a chemical lobotomy, but things end peacefully, however, when Sarah resigns from the NIH and moves to a small town with her new husband who now supports her so she can stay home because she's realized that raising Cindy is more important than any old job a woman can have. It's even more important than her orgasms. Now, you would think that would be probably the most chilling and devastating thing that could happen to a woman in the 1970s. The pill had hit the market in 1960. IUDs appeared in 68, and the first successful in vitro fertilization was carried out in 78. This changed forever how we made and had babies, and as a result, there was a lot of fear surrounding pregnancy and childbirth. Fortunately, horror paperbacks were there to reassure nervous parents that they should be terrified out of their minds. They addressed every new parent's fear with a resounding yes. Yes, having sex while pregnant will definitely cause your baby to die. Yes, your OBGYN probably wants to steal your unborn baby and turn him into some kind of new chemical compound to sell in Europe. Yes, you will probably be confined to a locked mental ward almost immediately after giving birth. Yes, if you have an abortion, the remains will be buried in a shallow grave behind the hospital where they'll be struck by lightning and reanimated as psychic killer brain-eating monsters who will telekinetically explode your womb. Spawn. Women made their way through this minefield of potential hazards with the guidance of their doctors, although horror novels wanted to warn them that their doctors were more likely to hire a hitman to run them over to protect their baby mill operation than write them a prescription. And the worst, absolute worst OBGY of them all was from William Wolfolk's 1980 novel, The Sendai. This book, by the way, if there are any people thinking about having kids here, it's full of helpful tints um, about childbirth and especially about the labor process, which is scary to a lot of people. Um, and I think its most important word of advice uh, for potential parents is when you are looking for a place for your delivery, do not choose to give birth in a delivery room that includes a conveyor belt leading to something the staff calls the off-limits building. Also, maybe probably don't give birth in a clinic that has something called the off-limits building. The Sendai is the childbirth medical thriller on crack. You can read a book like Embryo or the Premature or Crib, and, and well, not Spawn, but and you learn about the miracles of modern medicine while also getting slightly traumatized about all the things that can go wrong in the delivery room. Things going wrong in the delivery room are merely the truffle oil on the Sendai steak fries of lunacy buried beneath a thick layer of the Parmesan cheese of full throttle freakery. We start with new father, Tom Pollard, who has some doubts about this strange new science known as in vitro fertilization. It'll almost be as if she's having a baby with another man, he moans. It's unnatural. No, no, his doctor explains. It's like planting a garden full of peas. <laughs> Now, it's written in 1980, so you can forgive the Sendai both for its terrible gardening metaphors and its fears over test tube babies, because at that point there had only been two successful in vitro fertilization, so really, you could make up anything about it. So, Tom Pollard's wife, they have their test tube baby, and when it comes home, it's, it, in nine months, they had a little monster with coarse brown hair that covered its entire body in a small hump between its shoulder blades. Its forehead was steeply slanting and the jaw protruded. Long, fairy, hairy fingers dragged on the floor with pronounced knuckles. Then they had a little monkey baby. And, and you figure, surely a child this ugly must have a sweet disposition. No. Within three weeks, this thing is wearing denim and it's broken out of the crib. Finally, they find it locked in a death embrace with the neighbor's Dalmatian. On the bright side, on the bad side, they no longer have a baby and the neighbor doesn't have a dog anymore. But on the bright side, this kid is three weeks old. He's killing on a second grade level. So, so enter Dr. Rudy Gerson, who disappointed his dad when he became an OBGYN instead of a more macho kind of doctor. He's so committed to his patients that he ditches a date to offer himself up as a hostage when another IVF daddy takes a whole hospital floor full of nurses uh, at gunpoint because he's flipped out. And why is he flipped out? Well, when Dr. Rudy gets up there and he releases the nurses, he discovers it's another monkey baby. 
So Dr. Rudy drives upstairs to the Carl Clinic, which is two R's and three L's. It's uh, where he meets another boy doctor living in his father's shadow, Dr. Peter Bradford, who comes complete with a slinky Euro doctor sidekick named Dr. Le Toilier. One European, bad enough. But when Dr. Rudy discovers that the Carl Clinic's off-limits building is guarded by Conrad with a K, who's a disgraced Bavarian zookeeper with a limp, two. Europeans. This can only mean one thing, absolute evil. And what Dr. Rudy finds when he breaks into the off-limits building is exactly what you'd expect to find in a European-run fertility clinic. Wolves with pointy, pointy hooves, a talking gorilla who begs Dr. Rudy to let it die, a hyper-intelligent bird boy, and an Olympic-sized swimming pool full of seahorse fetus jellyfish creatures with whom Conrad has a romantic relationship. <laughs> The Europeans attempt to protect their failures of science with a watchdog cat, which they set after Dr. Rudy, which is a uh, dog's head on a cat's body, which means it can track you by scent and hop up on the couch. Uh, and like most Europeans, it has an insatiable appetite for American flesh. Dr. Rudy invades it, however, and finally confronts Dr. Bradford, who admits to breeding these little monkey babies, calling them the Sendai. They have been raised to be strong and servile. They can perform menial, repetitive tasks without becoming restless or bored. Get these Sendai to an Amazon warehouse. Uh, having these babies slaves? Yes, it's slavery, which is distasteful to all mankind, but will finally allow humanity to stop doing menial work and instead invent better math and write symphonies. Now, I'm just going to say, I'm from South Carolina. We had slavery for hundreds of years. All we gave the world was Dixie. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting a nice symphony. Um, Fortunately, Dr. Gerson throws some brain-eating bacteria in Dr. Letoilier's eyes, and without his European birthing buddy, Dr. Bradford winds up standing trial for being both arrogant and creepy. The Carl Clinic is shut down, and the bird boy sells his memoirs for millions of dollars and moves to Hollywood. You laugh, but this is not fiction. This is fiction immersed in fact. As William Woolfolk writes in the afterwards, what you have just read is not fiction. It is fiction immersed in fact. In England, human infants have regrown severed fingertips. A mouse with the head of a chicken has been produced in a laboratory. Time magazine reports that scientists' control of basic life processes have reached the point where we can have baby hatcheries that will produce everything from super brainy alphas to drone-like epsilons. I hope the implications of the questions raised here in my book will concern you long after my book is forgotten. Well, the book is definitely forgotten. And I can say with complete conviction, I am still paralyzed with terror at the thought of waking up in the middle of the night and seeing a chicken-headed mouse run across my apartment floor. So well done, William Wolfolk. Mission accomplished. Uh, the message of books like the Sendai was clear. Women should have babies by finding them in cabbage patches or getting them from the stork the way nature intended, rather than using their bulky, weird, dangerous wombs. And the only thing more dangerous, actually, than their wombs were crabs and dogs and cats, jellyfish. Um, ever since James Herbert wrote The Rats in 1974, the same year as Jaws was published, horror novelists were turning out books about animals who were hungry for human flesh and who hated England. If it walked, crawled, swam, or flew, it killed British people because as Japan is to giant monsters, England is to killer animals. I just want you to just take a look at this. Um, this is a map of England. <laughs> And these are just a handful <clears throat> of the animal attacks. Um, I just want to take a minute, you know, oh, look, I've got a laser pointer. There we go. See, piecing, ge pigs and geese on drugs overrun a farm in Hobbs Farm. Swarm of locusts. Uh, in Cornwall, the Long Point nuclear power plant causes mutant scorpion outbreak. Uh, mutant scorpions ruin circus in Kent. Spiders attack Kent. Kent's terrible. Rats in London. More rats in Epping Forest. Killer worms unleashed in Westport. French dog causes rabies outbreak. French cat causes rabies outbreak. French animals are clearly trouble. Mankind's last stand against the jellyfish down here in Totnes. Um, you know, so you can really see there's a lot of problems with, with animals, to be honest, in England. Um, and, and in reading these books, I had to keep track of them, right? I mean, I made a map. It's pretty sciencey. And And people ask me, you know, how do you do this? Do you have like, how do you remember which animals attack which town and which book? And I actually have a really simple mnemonic device I use uh, that I want to share with you right now. Uh, it goes a little like this. Uh, so what you do is you sit down and take a deep breath and you go, there are killer dogs and cats and bees and rats and evil bunnies too. Bears and worms and things that squirm inside this death zoo. Snakes and frogs and crabs and hogs and evil bunnies do. Bats and ants and cormorants all coming to eat you. See, it's really easy. I can even teach it to you. There are killer 
Dogs and cats and bees and rats and evil bunnies too. Bears and worms and things that squirm inside this death zoo. Snakes and frogs and crabs and hogs and evil bunnies do. That's French. Bats and ants and cormorants all coming to eat you. But wait, there's more. There are killer moths and slugs and deer and bugs and worms attack the tube. Gulls and pigs and cats and wigs and alligators too. Wolves and whales and crabs and snails and lizards who hate you. And tuna fish and jellyfish and things that squish inside this scaly, scary, smelly, hairy inside this death zoo. Ooh. Death Zoo. <clears throat> so, you know, it's the 70s, right? The 70s was the era of Satan and, and childbirth trauma and killer animals. But now I want you to imagine it's New Year's Eve, 1979. Gloria Gaynor is singing I Will Survive, and it's time to move to the 80s. Welcome to 1980, where everything is pumped. Life is a bitchin' ride in a sweet Porsche down a concrete highway covered in neon. Everyone's getting rich. America's number one. No room for guilt, no time for crying. Let's kill a commie for mommy and head to the mall. Greeting card technology was repurposed for the book business, and kludge embossers and boat stampers were working overtime to coat covers in foil. Look at that. Uh, embossed monsters and die-cut windows showing swanky step-back art. Mm. It's coming soon in the 80s. Hologram covers, mmm, coming right at ya. Presses were running hot, spitting out 450 new paperback titles every month. Industrial shredders were putting in heroic hours, thanks to something called the Thor Power Tool case of 1979 that changed tax depreciation laws, so encouraging publishers to shred slow-moving inventory to the tune of 100 million shredded paperbacks each year. The 70s have been shaped by grim, sober novels like The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby, which were about adults grappling with religion and faith, but the 80s were largely largely shaped by Stephen King. 1979 was the release of The Dead Zone, his first hardcover book to be hit on the New York Times bestseller list in his debut week. And by 1983, he had 40 million books in print. The exorcists were so squares, man. Rosemary's Baby smelt like grandma. If you wanted to do horror business in 1980, you got an endorsement from Uncle Steve, and he would pretty much endorse anything you put in front of him. Uh, <laughs> God helped the writer who told his editor they could get the big kahuna and actually failed. The 80s was the era of the horror blockbuster. Stephen King was the apex of this holy trinity of horror books, but the other two points on the sacred triangle, surprisingly, were both women. In 1976, reeling from the death of her daughter and deeply, deeply depressed and drinking way too much, Anne Rice wrote a minor novel called Interview with the Vampire. Um, about a really whiny vampire named Louie who constantly cries about how unfair life is and it sucks to be a vampire. Then, in 1985, it, it did okay. Sold some copies, made a movie deal, got her name out there, but it wasn't a big hit. But then in 1985, she wrote a book called The Vampire Lestat about a sexy vampire who doesn't whine about anything and is so self-confident he is a literal rock star. It became a massive hit and spawned another million-selling sequel in 1988 called Queen of the Dam. Anne Rice was vampires. She was, and we forget this now because she's not out there quite so much, she was right next to Stephen King on his left hand. And on his right hand, V.C. Andrews. Look at that fire, it's good, right? Uh, in 1979, Flowers in the Attic debuted, and by 81, Flowers and its sequel, Petals in the Wind, had sold seven million copies. I, I just want to take a minute. V.C. Andrews is one of my heroes. Um, she suffered from a condition that left her unable to move her spine. And she was confined to a wheelchair uh, and lived with her mother, who actually never read a single one of her daughter's books. Uh, and V.C. Andrews, Virginia, had actually, despite being in the wheelchair, supported her family and been their main source of income for her entire life. She was a commercial artist for, uh, doing catalog illustrations, uh, a freelance writer for confession magazines. Not surprisingly, one of her stories was called I Slept With My Uncle on My Wedding Night. Uh, she was a stock market day trader. And she did all that before Flowers in the Attic became this massive success when she was 58 years old. And I know, her books are campy. They're melodramatic. These, these stories of incest and abused children and bizarre families full of secrets are over the top. But Andrews only ever gave two interviews. One was to People Magazine, and they made her look like this kooky, gothic grandma and violated her two rules. They printed her age and showed a picture of her wheelchair, which she hated and did not want her readers to know about. Years later, a guy named Doug Winter was writing a book about horror, and he asked Virginia Andrews for an interview, and she granted it, only the second one she ever gave. And, and during the interview, he asked her about her wheelchair and her condition with her spine, and this is what she said. 
It's very traumatic, especially when you're young, to be yanked out of the mainstream of life because you have an illness that comes on you so unexpectedly. Suddenly you are not in control anymore. You're made helpless by circumstances that you had no say in. I always felt if I had done some terrible thing, this would be my punishment, but I haven't done anything yet. I always thought, I looked at God and said, why didn't you give me a chance? And that's why I write. When I wrote Flowers in the Attic, all of Kathy's feelings about being in prison were my feelings. I, I think the world is cruel. You find pockets of kindness, but you've got to make them yourself. You have to rely on yourself because it is so, so cruel, particularly when you are young. And there are so many cries out there in the night, so much secrecy in families, so many skeletons in closets that no one wants to think about, much less discuss. I, I hope my books have helped open a few doors that were not only locked, but concealed behind cobwebs. The fears I write about are the fears we have when we're children, the ones that never go away, the ones that follow us all our life, the fear of being helpless, the fear of being trapped, the fear of being out of control. For the first time in her life with these books, the money gave V.C. Andrews back her control, and it gave her the freedom to travel. She could get a wheelchair-accessible car and drive herself for the first time. She could buy a first-class ticket that could take her wheelchair because she couldn't fold it up and sit on a seat. She had to be completely flat. And it was the first time she left the country. So it's understandable that she hid her cancer diagnosis for as long as possible. She just started living. She didn't want to die. But in 1986, with her seven books selling 24 million copies, she finally told her agent she had cancer and had waited so long that two months later she passed away. Within days of her death, Simon & Schuster sent this memo to its staff saying that Virginia Andrews has left us a trove of unpublished novels and outlines that will allow us to keep publishing her books forever. In reality, the second she told them about her cancer diagnosis, they'd hung up the phone and started auditioning ghostwriters, and finally landed on a guy named Andrew Niederman, who was the author of books like Pen, about two kids who have an ancestral three-way relationship with a talking anatomical dummy. It's, it's actually a really good book. Um, in that last interview with Doug Winter, Andrew said she wanted to branch out. She was starting to feel trapped after seven books. She wanted to write in more genres. She said she had a historical novel she was working on. She wanted to write something about ESP. She wanted to try new things. She wanted to spread her wings. But Niederman came on the job now, and to date, he's written 68 books as Virginia Andrews. None of them are historical fiction. And it just goes to show you that you couldn't escape your brand, you couldn't escape your name, not even in death. And after these blockbuster writers, V.C. Andrews, Anne Rice, and Stephen King, there were the other authors, oh, there's still more V.C. Andrews, whose, whose names became their brands too, and also to some extent sometimes trapped them. People like Ramsey Campbell, Peter Straub, John Saul, Dean Coots, John Ferris, they were all bouncing up and down the bestseller list, earning most of their profit in paperback. Hard partying super agent Kirby McCauley had all the big names in horror in his stable, and he had two pieces of his advice. Write novels, the fatter the better, because that's what Stephen King does, and sell them in paperback, because hardcover is good for your ego, but it's terrible for sales. In the 80s, it was about blockbusters. Big publishers started gobbling up the little publishers, which was a trend that would speed up until it became an extinction-level event at the end of the decade. Once they'd eaten up the little guys, the big guys started opening their own imprints and flooding the market with more and more and more paperback originals. The 70s had been the era of the survivor. Survivors of the 60s, survivors of Vietnam, survivors of crab attacks, survivors of the economic crisis, the banned survivor. But the, the 80s... The 80s were one big party, and surprisingly, people still cared about Satan. You are a Vietnam veteran. You are six foot four and 230 pounds of solid muscle. You have close cropped hair. You can kill a man with your bare hands. You prefer not to. You are driving back to the small town somewhere in the south where you grew up. You've been away for years. You notice something strange. You realize that everyone in town is a sex pervert and a Satanist, especially the teenagers. You reunite with your high school sweetheart. She is a zombie. It takes you a while to figure that out. You are attacked by a dark force. You sing hymns to keep it at bay. You kill some Satanists. You kill some monsters. You kill a lot of teenagers. You, my friend, are in a William W. Johnstone novel. 
John Stone wrote 200 books, most of them westerns and men's adventure stories, but starting with his five-part Devil series in 1980, The Devil's Kiss, The Devil's Heart, The Devil's Touch, The Devil's Cat, The Devil's Laughter, he became a horror novelist. And every single one of his horror novels is totally and completely insane. John Stone has this shotgun full of tropes, uh, incest monsters, zombie girlfriends, ghost werewolves, killer dolls, an obsession with anal sex. And he just blasts it in the reader's face over and over and over again until nothing makes sense anymore. In the nursery, as you see here, a small town in Louisiana has been taken over by, quote, the Prince of Foulness, Lord of Darkness, and his best friend, master on earth of all things dark and ugly and evil and smelly and profane. The cops have been brought up by Satan, and they're given to ending conversations with statements like, Adley Kerr asked just to see the little puckered hole. Bye now. Uh, John Stone believes the satanic panic line that there are 145,000 satanic covens in America. And his job is to fight them by shining a light on their nefarious activities because they spread their message via heavy metal music, which teaches, as he writes, self-mutilation, assault, suicide, drugs, murder, sex, anti-establishment, and anti-social rebellion against parents, society, education, the church, and law and order. Sometimes a firm spanking is enough to drive the devil out of a teenager, but mostly they have to be shot in the face. Dogs are good and often form armies to help humans fight Satan, whereas cats can sort of go either way. Toy Story reaches maximum John Stonage. In it, Jay Clute, a Vietnam vet, returns to Victory, Missouri, where he grew up, nine-year-old daughter Kelly in tow. His Aunt Carrie died, and he's there to settle her estate and then get out of Dodge. Not going to happen. Within hours of his arrival, Jay discovers that the two major local landmarks are an enormous doll factory in the center of town run by an obese pedophile named Bruno Dixon, who uses it to film satanic kitty porn, and a high-security hospital-slash-mental institution-slash-underground research facility on the other side of town that houses, quote, the products of incest, which turn out to be seven-foot-tall man monsters with apple-sized heads and superhuman strength, and surprisingly part of their treatment that's approved by the doctors is to lit them out after dark every night where they run around at random and attack cars. Tiny toys are running amok through the streets, and unfortunately, so does incest. Uh, Jay and his daughter are mind-controlled by evil and almost hook up on their first night in victory, but they're saved when the crosses they're wearing around their necks clink together and snap them back into reality. <laughs> Reading this book becomes like trying to drive in some kind of post-concussion haze. The harder you focus, the more it all slips away. A checkout girl's head explodes and no one seems to mind. Possessed teenage boys follow Kelly through town, propositioning them through sex, propositioning her through sex until she fights them with karate and then kills one of them with a fire axe. No one seems to notice. As one person cries in despair, if any of us knew anything, we could do something about it. The only person who seems to know anything is the ghost of Aunt Carrie, who materializes halfway through the book to call Jay piss pants four times in a row and then have ghost incest with her dead brother in front of everybody, which is disgusting. It turns out her dead brother is a ghost werewolf who can only be killed by a silver stake being driven through his heart, which then happens. Uh, then Aunt Carrie explains the plot, but in the nine-page explanation, she entirely leaves out the role played by the killer toy armies. So I'm going to sort of do what Aunt Carrie can't right now. So see, there are these two toy armies. Um, one army lives in the toy factory with Bruno Dixon and, and they're evil. And then the others are broken and injured toys who live in, in the old clue place out on the edge of town uh, where they kill and eat neighborhood pets. So that's sort of a gray zone, morally speaking. But they also tap out help us in Morse code, and they have funerals for a tiny clown doll who dies, which is really sweet. So we'll call them good. Um, now, some of the evil toys are local citizens who've been turned into doll-sized humans. And others, though, in town, some of the residents are tiny toys who've been turned into human-sized dolls. At a certain point, I don't even know anymore. You're on your own. Um, <laughs> The best way to understand Johnston's work is to read it for yourself. So I want to share with you guys some quotes uh, from Toy Cemetery. Uh, I think they're all from Toy Cemetery. I told you before, Jimmy, no. I like to fuck with you, but my ass is my own. <laughs> they finally wrote me off as a kook. Are you a kook? No, I'm a best-selling author of historical romances. <laughs> I wouldn't stick a fertilized fence post in you, Linda. <laughs> The fetus is rested in fetal position. <laughs> Hurry up, Al, a woman urged. This has got me all sexed up. Let's go back to the barracks and fuck. I want you to fuck my ass. Perhaps a deal could be arranged between them, her pussy and her ass, for her life eternal. The jeans she wore didn't help either. Her womanhood was practically <laughs> leaping out at him. Amy pressed the gas pedal to the floor and roared through the line of humans. Blood splattered on the hood and windshield. Wet eyeballs slammed against the windshield and clung there, staring blindly at the men and women inside. Get them off! Amy screamed. The eyeballs blinked, looking at her through the windshield. Jim reached over and turned on the windshield wipers. 
Ed Connor spilled coffee down the front of his shirt. Are you fucking joking with me? I'm fucking serious as death, sir. Connors refilled his cup. Go on. And then this one's my favorite. It sort of grows, so just ease into this one like a warm bath. On the other side of town, Chef Rodale pushed back his chair from the supper table and belched loudly, causing his long-suffering wife to cringe as she stood by the dishwasher in the kitchen. Fanny's there, Betty Mae, he hollered. Then he lifted his leg and farted. The dog got up from underneath the dining room table, a pained expression on its face, and left the room. I love that dog. Uh, so covers had started to sort of develop a vocabulary in the 80s, and we've got these cover artists who are going to talk about this with us afterwards, but so many of these covers were coming out so quickly, the art directors were calling the shots, but it's almost like the, there, there was this telepathic group mind going on that was starting to tell us what we were afraid of simply by looking at the paperback rack. And what it turned out we were scared of was clowns, and clowns, and mimes, and clowns, and clown dolls. And dolls, and dolls, and dolls, 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 clowns, dolls, dolls, dolls. You know, you're probably asking yourself, what's up with all these dolls? We're going to talk about that afterwards. There is an answer. But it wasn't just dolls and clowns and mimes and clown dolls that were scary in the 80s. In the 80s, everything was scary. Sleep was scary. Uh, songs were scary. Colors were scary. Bad breath was scary. Office parties were scary. Siblings were scary. Soap operas were scary. Tree houses were very scary. Um, 18th century Viennese dance crazes were scary, but as the decade ended, the scariest thing of all appeared, the one that would kill the genre. Everything changed in 1988 when Silence of the Lambs came out and won the World Fantasy Award and the Stoker Award, because suddenly all anyone wanted to talk about were serial killers. In 1991, the movie version of Silence of the Lambs won eight Oscars and became an exorcist-sized phenomena. As the 80s became the 90s, gore was in. And nothing tracked what was happening better than Rex Miller's chain gang novels. So Miller's widely hyped slob had appeared in 87 to much sweaty palm page turning. Miller in this book introduced readers to Daniel Chain Gang Bunkowski. Remember this is a year before Silence of the Lambs appeared. Bunkowski is a 469 pound homeless man living in his car who prowls the Midwest committing random sex crimes and murdering people. At first you kind of felt like this was an attempt to put the pathetic squalor of the actual serial killer on the page. Bunkowski is a junk food addicted monstrosity who eats 40 egg rolls at a sitting and whose breath smells, quote, like stale burritos, wild onions and garlic, bad tuna, and your basic terminal halitosis. Then, after this, one book later, Silence of the Lambs won all those Academy Awards. In real life, serial killers are usually poorly educated rapists with substance abuse problems who are prone to bedwetting and setting fires. But Hannibal Lecter convinced us that they are collectors of fine art, connoisseurs of vintage wine, avengers of the weak, men of taste and refinement. And so over the course of the next Bunkowski books, Chain Gang in 92, Savant in 94, Butcher in 94 also, Miller turned Bunkowski into a role model. The first thing he did was make him a product of the Vietnam era black ops program to breed the perfect killer. There seemed to be a lot of these programs going around. Then he made sure that readers knew that Bunkowski warped every curve, deviated from every chart. He was that rare human being called the physical precognitive, an autodidact with genius level intellect. He has a photographic memory, the ability to detect the presence of human life in a house. He understands fluid mechanics and possesses the natural skills of a consummate actor. He knows how to make a smart bomb activated by an ordinary kitchen food timer, a device for starting an undetectable fire. He is immune to poison ivy. It's good. By the time the last book came out, Bunkowski, who we meet in the first book, raping a woman, breaking her neck, and stuffing her in a garbage choke ditch has developed the ability to turn invisible in darkness by regulating his respiration and heart rate like a ninja. And he's adopted five adorable puppies that actually live in the pockets of his overalls while he murders people and they crawl all over him. He, serial killers were no longer a menace. They're not even cartoons. They had become superheroes. Serial killers were everywhere on horror books. Cover artists moved to romance novels because his artist Lisa Falkenstern, who's actually here tonight, said instead of being funny and clever, horror covers had gotten ugly and, and gross. Women were being raped and murdered on every other page, which led uh, editor Gene Cavellis to found the Dell Abyss imprint with uh, covers by people like Marshall Arisman, which were really gorgeous and devoted not 
as Jean Cavallo said, devoted specifically to not publishing, as she says, sexist, creepy ass Stephen King ripoffs. Uh, Abyss put out books that were unlike anything else on the market. They were wildly experimental and deeply diverse and genuinely fresh, but it was too late. It's the early 90s and serial killers are everywhere. The horror novel market was glutted with too much product and the inevitable crash is happening fast. Imprints are collapsing like punctured lungs. Writers are begging their editors to market their books as thrillers instead of horror. Serial killers were cut and pasted into supernatural horror novels. Paper costs are going up. Distribution is becoming harder. Publishers are just shoveling books onto stores faster than readers can buy them. And returns are flooding back into warehouses before being dumped into shredders by the hundreds of millions. One by one, the horror publishers cut their horror lines. And finally, Zebra, the last remaining horror paperback publisher, closed down the skeleton farm in 1995. The books were gone, and the boom was over. Was the murderer a serial killer in a dark alley with bad taste? Was it a collapsing publishing industry with an overproduction bubble? Was it both of them working together? It could have been either. Either way, time of death, 1996. And the books we're talking about tonight, they're mostly out of print. Uh, their authors are mostly forgotten. You can pick them up at a paperback swap shop or get them on Amazon for a penny plus shipping. And the question people ask me whenever I do this talk is, do you ever shut up? But right after <laughs> that question, they ask, are any of these books any good? And I say, oh, hell yes. It makes me so angry that the world has forgotten Joan Sampson's Auctioneer, which is basically Stephen King's Needful Things as written by Cormac McCarthy, or Michael McDowell's Blackwater Saga. Michael McDowell would go on to write The Nightmare Before Christmas and Beetlejuice for Tim Burton, but these six horror paperback originals are the 100 years of solitude of, of horror. Uh, Elizabeth Ingstrom's When Darkness Loves Us is one of the most disturbing books about motherhood I've ever read. Barry Wood, who wrote Dead Ringers, the uh, novel that Cronenberg's film is based on, uh, also wrote The Tribes, uh, about the most touching and sad, berserk Jewish golem running amok on Long Island in 1979. Uh, but none of these authors is as tragically forgotten as Ken Greenhaw. Now, cultural gatekeepers are important. Editors, music producers, A&R guys, they make sure that the books that are published, the records that come out, hit a certain level of quality. Um, but Ken Greenhall was where cultural gatekeepers failed across the board. He was the heir to Shirley Jackson's sort of quiet, assured, precise voice. And, and he got the worst covers. When he was 55, his own agent fired him for being too old to represent any longer. And he always had to have a day job as an encyclopedia editor. He lived up in the uh, Queens. He was this quiet guy. He built a harpsichord and taught himself how to play it because he just wanted to know if he could. He liked harpsichord music. And he wrote his first book, Elizabeth, under his mother's maiden name because he liked to read and he just wanted to see if he could write a book. And so I want to leave you guys with the opening of Elizabeth. It's the last thing I do tonight, but this is what I want you to hear before you go because I, I think it's, his stuff is extraordinary. When grandmother vanished, the glass of the large mirror in her bedroom was found scattered on the floor in small pieces like the remains of a mosaic. Have you ever thought about mirrors? Maybe you have. In your bathroom, perhaps on a quiet Sunday night while you were performing one of those personal acts you never speak of. Perhaps you were cutting the hair that grows in the darkness of your nostrils. The only sound was the snipping of the tiny scissors. I hope you're not embarrassed to have me speak so frankly to you. Remember that I am no longer a child. I am a young woman. My mirror tells me so, and the eyes of men tell me so. When I was younger, I saw James, my father's brother, look from our dog to me without changing his expression. I soon taught him to look at me in a way he looked at nothing else. But I was speaking of mirrors. Have you thought of how you depend on them? Would you be convinced of your beauty or your unconventional attractiveness if the mirror didn't reassure you so many times each day? Perhaps you're being deceived. Your skin may not really be so unblemished. The sensual curve of your lower lip you're so proud of may be flawed by a slackness on one side. There's no way to know if what your mirror shows is what you see or what is really there. My name is Elizabeth Kuttner and I am 14 years old. I know you would be more interested in my story if I were a middle-aged person, but I ask you to remember what you were like when you were 14. Is there a chance you were more perceptive then than you are now? Almost certainly you were passionately interested in something then. What is your passionate interest now? I'll admit there are many things I know very little about, but there are many things I do know. I know, for example, that you recently sat watching television with someone you're supposed to love and that you thought neither of that person nor of what you were watching. Perhaps you thought longingly or, longingly or regretfully of something that happened when you were 14. I think I know how the world seems to you. That might not have been true two years ago when I was a girl, but as I have told you, I'm a woman now, and there is no feeling you have had that I have not had. It is possible that I have had important experiences that were denied you. I think you will come to believe that. 
I first came to live with my grandmother about a year ago, right after I killed both my parents. Let me explain. Those are the first words Greenhall ever wrote in 1976, and he wrote five more novels, each one from a smaller imprint, each with a worse cover, and then he retired in 92 and devoted his life to his dream project, Lenore, which is a historical novel about the freed slave in Amsterdam who posed for the Rubin study, uh, Four Studies of the Head of a Negro. This is one of the most, it's historical fiction, it's not horror, and I'm given to hyperbole, but this is one of the most beautiful, funniest books of historical fiction I've ever read. The publisher who put it out was a small press that mostly released poetry, but it was Ken's first hardcover book, and he was enormously proud. And it got him his first review in the New York Times, and he was so excited, and they trashed it. It is one of the vilest, most sarcastic, snarkiest, needlessly cruel things I have ever read. And I spoke with Ken's widow, Agnes, several times while writing this book, and she told me the review broke Ken's heart, and he never wrote again. 16 years later, he died. He was an old man, Agnes said. He was sick. He was tired of fighting. He was tired of no one listening. He was done. But he's not done. Because a book is a life an author leaves us. They have poured all their experiences, all their heartbreak, all their joy, all their weirdness into these pages. And if you ever pick up a copy of Lenore, or Elizabeth, or Hellhound, or The Auctioneer, or The Tribe, you're holding a piece of that writer's life. Because as long as a writer has readers, they cannot die. These books have been forgotten for decades, but they are not dead. They're just sleeping underground, waiting in the darkness, waiting to burst forth and live again, waiting for a new pair of eyes, waiting for you. Before we go tonight, I just have one last thing I want to say. <clears throat> it's something I want you to take home with you. But it's not really for you at all. <clears throat> I want to speak for a moment to all the skeletons in the room sitting inside these meat bags. There are a lot of people who say, if you're a skeleton, you can't follow your dreams. Your job's just to hold up our muscles and protect our internal organs, and maybe one day, if you're lucky, get turned into a xylophone. But I want to say, no. I want to tell every skeleton listening right now, if you're a skeleton, you can play banjo. <laughs> get on your pony. Off you go. Skeletons, you can be a bride. Maybe take a ride, maybe on your trike, maybe join the Third Reich. Skeletons, go be a southern lady, you can deliver a baby, you can sit on the moon, you can be a balloon. Skeletons, they say you're nothing, just an old pile of bones, so call me up on your telephones, cause I want you to know you can play piano. Skeletons, I don't want you to be down, cause you can be a clown. You can live underwater, raise an unskeleton daughter, deliver our letters, wear varsity sweaters. You can totally rock, jog around the block. You can be First Nations, attend graduations, dress like a racist cliche, play your panpipes all day, be a cavalier. Lear, drink a tankard of beer, you can get online, you can even keep time, cause nothing's gonna stop my skeleton, no one's gonna stop our skeletons, they'll be here long after we're gone, our beautiful angels, our skeletons, thank you. So right now, can we get the lights up? I want to invite the artists who are responsible for these covers you've been looking at tonight. Um, 
they are some of the most extraordinary people, and I, I have to say it, I'm not just sucking up to them because they're in the room, but meeting these guys, and, and it's one of the big privileges of writing this book. The money's nice too, I appreciate the applause, but it has been so incredible to put artists to covers, and nothing has made me happier than figuring out who did what and who painted what. So we're gonna have a conversation now, uh, and also Chad Laird is gonna join us from FIT. He teaches in the art history department. He's gonna be our horror guy, and um, you can ask questions as we talk. I've got slides to go through. We're going to chat, but this is the loosey-goosey part. I'm not going to sing again. You can relax. Um, so can we all please come up? Uh, come on up, you guys. I will introduce them after they get up here, but don't take this seat. It's mine. Yeah, please. Come on up. Hey, Chad. Hey, thanks. Lisa. Come on up, man. Okay, so I just want to introduce you guys to who is up here, and then I'll let them introduce themselves. Is there? Oh no. Okay, here. You take one of you take this chair, and one of you take the other one. <laughs> Separating you two. Uh, so. Just to let you guys know sort of who is here, um, we have uh, looking for seats right now. Uh, this is Mark Gerber and Stephanie Gerber. In the middle is Tom Hallman, Jill Bauman, Lisa Falkenstern, and Chad Laird over at the end. And actually, I wanted to ask Chad just sort of um, to start off with, did you, because you're a horror film guy, did you read the books, these paperbacks? I did not read these paperbacks. <laughs> None of them. Actually, I read one page of a Stephen King book. But did you like see them on the racks? When I you saw were them all the time. Um, I grew up, uh, I'm born in 1972, and I have um, a real, a, some really intense memories um, of these books. They were around, primarily I remember them in homes. Uh, they were these kind of signifiers of adulthood uh, and as this kind of dark, weird place, and I, once picked up a copy of Carrie when I was too young to be reading it, and I was stopped by a parent um, right in the middle of <laughs> something I was going right over my head. And I really, the, the thing that really stuck with me, and I was so glad that you reproduced it in the book, it was The Crooked Tree by Robert C. Wilson. Oh, yeah. And I was eight years old, and it's this die cut cover uh, with a bear on the, you know, inside the hole. And I was, little, I think I was about eight years old. And I liked bears, I loved animals, and animals are great. I love to draw bears. And it was a kind of barely innocuous looking bear. It had some blood on its mouth. And when you opened the cover, the bear had a voluptuous human female body that was nude. <laughs> and it was straddling a man's corpse and eating its guts. <laughs> and I shut it and I thought, wow. I mean, this is a lot of sex, death, kind of desire stuff going on. I started to read it. I got to the part where the car breaks down in the, in the side of the road, and I had to stop. It. But, and that, that cover stuck with me, and, and well, I saw it. I, I was hoping as I was reading the book, God, I hope that crazy bear cover is in the book. And it was. Um, and there, there, there's just these images all throughout my childhood, primarily in homes, relatives' homes, but also in the drugstores and the bookstores. It really stuck with me. Well, these are the artists whose fault that is. Uh, you're next to them. So can you guys introduce yourselves? And I'm going to go kind of, if you can keep your bio short, because I want to get to the conversation part, but just sort of who you are and, and what you did. So I know, it's, sum up your whole life in a few sentences. But at first up, the woman responsible for these two covers, uh, Jill Bauman. I did it. Thank you. Yes, please. And that's your daughter, right? On the Oh yeah, that's my daughter. I made her lie over a dresser backwards. She's still talking about why her back hurts today. You know, it's like <laughs> further back, further back. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've been putting these covers on books for thirty eight years. And uh, thanks to Grady, I now know I'm vintage. <laughs> I never knew that. You know. <laughs> Because we just do them, and then they live in the closet, you know, someplace like that, and you move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But I went through that era, never knowing, thanks to Grady, that you would immortalize all of this <laughs> or categorize for historical records, of course. Thank you. And just really quickly, you didn't go to art school, right? No, I'm probably one of the only ones here who didn't go to art school. And Walter Velez was who you worked with to sort of mentor you or the illustrator? Uh, he was my mentor, but I'm his agent. I've been his agent for like 39 years. So, okay. Yeah. So next up, 
Lisa Falkenstern, um, <laughs> who I love tricycle. That skeleton on the trike is so amazing. So Lisa, please give her a round of applause, folks. So, Any, you know, did you go to art school and sort of what was your basic? I, uh, I went to Parsons and uh, I came out not knowing how to do anything except draw. And then I went back to Parsons at night school. And there was an art director there, Milton Charles, who was looking to get artists and you know who could do realistic things. And he decided to go to, to get students, teach them how to paint. And as soon as we could paint, he started giving us work. So he gave 40 students a start. And I was the second one to, get, to go and get professional, so that's how I started. And you were a V.C. Andrews cover artist for a long time. Yeah, I, I was uh, after Jillian Hills. There was Jillian Hills, then there was Paula Joseph, and then I took over, and then I got replaced, and then I got pulled back, and then I got replaced again, so yeah. But I, how many covers did you wind up doing for Andrews books? You know, I was up in my attic yesterday, the other day with a friend, and it was just like, and he's looking for horror, and I kept saying, that's V.C. Andrews. That's V.C. Andrews. <laughs> I, I, you know, I did it for, I'll have to ask Paolo, he's here, the art director. I, I, I can't tell you, you know, it yeah. has to be dozens. Um, and then at the end, you moved over into uh, romance covers, right, in the 90s? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I still did a little, I did, still did horror, but at the time, I just, they were, they were getting gross. And so, yeah. you know, my husband, I ended up marrying Milton Charles, and, and at the time, he was like, well, I, need, I now need romance covers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did romance and then mystery and then everything else. All right, and then next up is Tom Hallman, uh, responsible for the inimitable Gila cover. <laughs> Tom, and you're not a New Yorker. No, I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania, so uh, had to and leave it to be I gotta say, Tom came all the way from Philly just to do this, so give him some applause, please. <laughs> um, my distinction was that I was uh, kicked out of high school art major class with two months to go in my senior year uh, when my uh, teacher found out that I was a senior and thought I was a junior, thought I had another year, and I had no plans after, college, after high school. So he's like, go to the guidance office, don't come back until you have a school. So I was there for three or four days, came back, and eventually got into Kutztown State College, which uh, halfway through the year, so I was a semester late. Um, went through the program there, it was a great school, really enjoyed it, uh, came out wanting to be a uh, freelance illustrator, did um, uh, editorial work and some advertising, this and that, and I had friends that, from college that were working at NAL, Signet Books, uh, worked, uh, Jim Labad worked with Jim Flamary. Um, so f he said, just keep promoting to Jim, he'll give you a job, he'll give you a job. So I, for two years I sent Jim Flamary and many other art directors, uh, a new promo every month. Every month I was cutting a piece of uh, a photo on, sticking it onto a card with my name and phone number, and that was it, and just sent it out to them. And eventually Jim gives me a call, and he, two years later he says, you know, I have to pay you back for all those promo cards that you sent me. And he gave me my first job, which was a book called Masquerade, uh, Camouflage and Deception Techniques of World War II. Well, wait, yeah. We'll get to that. We'll get yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. anyway, that whole scenario led to 26 years and over 400 covers with this art director. So that was my start. That gave me my career. And he gave me not only horror, he gave me sci-fi, he gave me um, fantasy, uh, mystery, all sorts of things. And just challenged me every single time. So that was a godsend. Yeah. And, and then lastly, we have Mark and Stephanie Gerber, who've never done this. With, uh, you guys, y'all are old hat to me. But you guys, I, I know nothing about your bio. And here's a little of their work. The jogging skeleton is yours, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and seed of evil? OK, thank god I got them right. Um, but yeah, thank god skeletons getting the exercise they need. Um, so can you guys give us some of your bio? Because I literally know nothing about the two of you. This is so funny. <laughs> At each other since kindergarten, and we went to school um, in Utah. It was a really good commercial arts school, and we just fell into this. I don't know how we we did. We our first illustrations were for Beaver magazine. <laughs> 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 that's, 
that's how we got our start. And um, we had a really good friend from Utah that had moved here, and he helped us get started. Um, but we just found this to be so fun. It was just, we didn't take it, you can take it too seriously, but it was just so fun. We did a lot of other things too, like um, political mag, um, book covers and some other stuff, but this was really fun. Any, any <laughs> romance covers we tried to do looked like <laughs> romance from hell. So <laughs> we like, that didn't work. But it was just, it was really fun. And we worked together sometimes on the same illustration and it was great. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you guys, because y'all are mostly, I see your signature is either Gerber or y'all are credited together. How does that work? Do you work on the same one? Like, who does what? Like, how does that kind of collaboration work? Because it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talk more than he does. Okay. Um, well, um, when we first started, um, he drew a lot better than I did, and I painted a lot better than he did. So when we needed to do monsters, he would draw them and then I would paint them because I, didn't, I couldn't create monsters very well. Um, but there really wasn't ever any competition. It was like a joint effort and we just had fun. Um, we'd take, for, um, for reference, we'd take photos of each other. And sometimes those were just so, those were like <laughs> beyond belief. Like my favorite one was Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark was standing on a table, and he was like crouched like this to try to create a monster. And one, his father was involved, and we had to push his head next to a window really close so it would kind of smudge. <laughs> it was just always fun. And then did you, do you guys still do book covers, or did you all move out of it eventually? Um, well, when the computer came, it was really complicated. We we moved out of the city, and then the computer came, and I went to fine art, and Mark stayed with the computer, so it kind of like fell apart. About like when you said, it's like right. about what nineties, mid nineties, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing I want to, uh, to talk about you guys with is um, we're at FIT. They have a great illustration program. I don't know. Is anyone from the illustration program here? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, anyways, um, but what I want to talk about is sort of the, the practical part of doing these pictures. I mean, this was a whole industry located in New York dedicated to making these covers. And so just to give people an idea, I mean, or actually, let's talk about your first work. Can we, let's do that first. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, so Jill, yeah. that, is that, that, that's your first or second cover? Uh, I think it's like the third. The Very third. close. Very Attack close. of the Giant Baby. Yeah, like it, 1980 or something. Okay, and could you just talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, they have this uh, in publishing, this sludge pile of manuscripts that event, they have to publish by a certain time. It could be years later. And they were patting me on the head, you know, because I had done two other covers for uh, Charlie Grant. I had done right. a cover. And Nick Yarmakoff, who's now Simon Hawk. Um, and so they had to have this thing published, so they threw me a bone and they threw this thing at me, the attack of the giant baby. And uh, it's sort of like, honey, I shrunk the kids. Uh, in this case, the father is a scientist and the kid's crawling around, he has to watch the kid and the, he drops some formula, the kid eats it and grows. You know, being a New Yorker, of course, and I think it was in New York, the story, went to Central Park as he grew this big, this large, and so of course, the first thing I had was the Empire State, but I decided that was King Kong's territory and went for the Chrysler Building. It's more beautiful anyway. So I did that. But it's a six-foot painting, you see. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, three-foot painting. It's a three-foot painting. It's, it's big because I couldn't seem to do the attack of the giant baby on a small canvas. And I drag it into Berkeley, you know, and that was that. Oh, you like the diaper thing, huh? Oh, and oh, the diaper, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I first painted it, it wasn't diapered. And in the middle of the night, I was to hand it in the next day. It was like this thing woke me up in the middle of the night. I said, oh my God, I have to diaper that baby. <laughs> They're never going to accept it without the diaper. So I put the diaper on and brought it in the next day. <laughs> and so, Lisa, what was your very first cover? I don't remember your first horror cover. Uh, the, first, oh, the first cover I ever did was a, a cover called The Hell Candidate. Oh, right, right, right. And it was, a, it was a head of a devil, but it was completely wrapped in the American flag. 
and that was the first job. That it was supposed to be a little tiny thing, and then when I brought it in, they liked it so much they made it the uh, the entire cover. It was supposed to be like the back or something. It was just supposed to be like a spot with big type. Got it. Got it. And then, Tom, that's your masquerade, right? Yes. Amazing candle. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. The first cover you ever got. Um, the first cover I ever got was uh, called The Cure for Avon oh. by, with uh, Barbara Bertoli, art director. Um, just these hands reaching up. But uh, this was the first job I did with Jim Plumeri after he gave me all the work, um, or the, after the two years of promoting. And uh, I just liked it for the Bugs Bunny factor, the uh, sense that a car or, or a tank in this case is hiding behind a very thin tree. It was great. I went out and bought a tank or a tank a kit, took pictures of it, and, uh, you know, uh, painted from that. And, um, but my very first horror book, if you want to... Yeah, what was your first horror novel? Uh, there was a second book with Jim, uh, came shortly after this one in 79. It was called An Affair of Sorcerers by uh, George Chesbro. Now, I was jealous by the characters that you guys had. You'd have... Uh, uh, you know, zombie babies or <laughs> teenagers being chased by uh, skeletons on horseback or dolls hanging from a noose. Uh, the main character for my book was a one-time circus performing acrobat. acrobat. Um, he was a uh, uh, genius IQ. He was a, uh, became a professor of criminology and uh, he then became a very excellent uh, private investigator, uh, but he was also a dwarf. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> he, was, he was Mongo the Magnificent in, as an acrobatic um, uh, dwarf. And um, the, so this is my second cover. I've never done anything in the occult before, so what do I do? Um, I've got kitchen knives. I've got a friend that lives next door. He put on a bathrobe. I put a towel over his head. Uh, we took a few poses, so that's him. Um, my nephew, seven-year-old, I put a big baggy coat on him, and then uh, my accountant somehow showed up on the cover. Um, so yeah, I, I thought, you know, babies, zombie babies, uh, skeletons, all that. I got this, nobody else got this, you know. No, wait, before we move on, Chad, traumatizing or not traumatizing, if you saw that as a child? I, I had I seen that as a child, I probably put that in the traumatizing category. Okay, fair yes, enough, fair yes. enough. Midgets with guns, always traumatizing. So, Mark and Stephanie, I don't know what y'all's first horror cover was. I just threw up some of your, is that the one with uh, Mark's dad up there with his face yes. getting pressed into the window? Yes, it yeah. is. Um, and, and here are your Nazi psychic children with their green foil eyes. Um, in psychic spot. Yes. Well, what was y'all's first horror cover? Do you remember? I don't remember the title, but it was a little girl. Um, it was for Mike Capabianco, but I can't remember now the publisher. Um, but it was a little girl. Was it Teller? Um, it was a little girl breaking through a brick wall. So it was like she was half in and half out, and and it was it was great. The, when we left Idaho, the last painting I sold was for twenty five dollars. So to move to Manhattan, and the first cover we made was 600, we were just, <laughs> like, we couldn't believe it. Like, pinches, are we really here? But it, it, was, it was always fun. So for all you guys, sort of in general, I'm kind of curious if anyone has something to say, but was the horror market the big market if you were doing book covers at that moment, or were there other things that were competitive that were maybe, I don't know, why, why so many, were they easy to get into, or? Sword and sorcery was and fan, high fantasy was oh. very big as well okay. at the same time. Okay. But were people w working back and forth? Were there fantasy artists doing a lot of horror and horror artists doing much fantasy at the same time? Or I did, I did a lot of science fiction, fantasy. More, well, I'm all over the map anyway. But most of the high, you know, the Rowenas of the world and Boris and those folks, they stayed in that genre. They were given contracts to do that style. To do fantasy. Yeah, they were locked okay. into that pretty yeah. much. That's where they were. You know, the, the brass brazier chain to the rock, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so moving to the next thing. So this is, I just want people to see it. So that's one of Jill's on the right, Blizzard. And this is Tom's Judgment Day on the left. Um, and I'm sorry my copy's so crummy. But, I mean, these are originally paintings. I'm, these are the, the paintings. So 
can you, you guys talk a little bit about how these got made? I mean, how, how it went from these giant paintings to the cover of a book. If anyone wants to give sort of a rundown of what that process was. Um, sure. Uh, in this case, uh, again, I want to refer to Jim Plumeri an awful lot. His method of working was uh, he would come up, you know, I never read any of these books, ever. Uh, Wait, can I interrupt? Who, who read the manuscripts before you did the cover? Everyone except Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, because of Jim Plumeri, I would receive a comp from him, and they're, they're on my Instagram. They show up. The process is yeah. really cool to actually still remember that I, I have these things, so they're showing up now on the web. Um, he would send me a comp. He called me up, and then he'd say, I'm going to send you something, and it'd be framed in a nice mat, but it'd be a wash drawing on a Xerox, just very rough, but generically, or, or generally there. Right. And then it would just be my interpretation of it. We would talk it out, and then I would do this. So, but in this case, you know, I would have to, okay, get the models, uh, figure out the graphic that he was after. But, you know, his design sense was so simplistic and focused, it was just a dream art director to have as my mentor. So this was an ex-girlfriend, and this uh, was my niece who posed for many poses, or for many covers. And they weren't there together at the time, but uh, that's pretty much it. It's acrylic on masonite. OK. Uh, probably. But then how, how big? Because I know you guys all paint different sizes to yeah. get reduced. But like, what was your preferred size? My ratio for a head was probably the smallest I would go is maybe 3 quarters of an inch. And then the painting would go accordingly. So I would be twice the size of a hardcover or of a paperback. Um, early on, I had to do a four foot painting because of some craziness with bleed up on top. But, uh, Actually, yeah. someone wanted to ask a question really quickly. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say incredible presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> welcome. And, um, beautiful artwork. I grew up, you know, I love of art. <laughs> My mother is um, extremely interested in horror. Um, but with my growing up, I was more attracted to, I guess, um, horror movies that had protagonists who were like mediums or they had this intelligence and this great ability, so not so campy. Um, my question is, I guess, typecasting or the, the characters used in horror films. Of course, the blonde, she's the, the dumb one in the movie who's running and gets killed. And then the brunette is, is, is always the, the more intelligent one, you know. Um, Nightmare on M Street, you know, you look at all those movies, and then even Stephen King. Um, and then even when you look at certain movies, particularly the, the, the person of color or the African American, killed off immediately. One thing I liked about Stephen King is, I think in The Shining, um, Doc, you know, the little boy, and how he had a relationship with the, the man who was the cook. And I think that was my first time to see a portrayal of an actual African American in a horror movie or even a horror book that had almost a positive um, portrayal. So my question to you and the entire panel is, you know, because I began reading more, I would say, like Joe Nesbo, more detective type books. Um, but I always love horror. But why do you think we don't have these strong um, African American um, figures in horror movies where they're leaders? Like, you know, I saw The Black Exorcist, but other than that, I haven't really seen anything. Well, no, it's interesting. Actually, Chad, this was probably something you'll hit it out of the park on. But what's really interesting is reading these books, there were so few African American or even Chinese or Asian or Japanese or Hispanic. or There were almost no main characters or protagonists of color. It was really rare. Black Exorcist was put out by a company called Holloway House, which was out of LA. And it published only books for the African American market. And what's really interesting is they published uh, Donald Goyne's novels and Iceberg Slim. And most of their books were crime or romance or um, men's adventure stuff. They published, I think all told, like six or 700 paperbacks. And only four were horror. And it, it's a real, and, but horror movies were totally different. I mean, Chad, horror movies did have African. What do you think we're going to do? This well, right now. It's well, not a popular genre. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, right now it's. Yeah. It's reflect that positive. Well, no, and, and it's changed. Yeah. Yeah, and it's totally changed. Like right now, there's some really good African American writers working. Uh, Victor Laval, 
uh, is amazing. Um, and I kind of think that there are two great horror novels of the 20th century. One's Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House, and one's uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is an incredible, it's a ghost book, and it's an amazing novel. Um, and I think it, it's a horror novel. Um, yeah. And you see more and more uh, protagonists of color now in fiction, um, and you're seeing more writers of color come in. Um, but it really, in the 70s and 80s, it just did not exist. Um, Chad, in movies, it was really different, though. Um, it's, it, it's really interesting because there, there are a couple of examples. I don't know if you've seen Night of the Living Dead or Dawn of the Dead yes. uh -huh. by George Romero. Um, and there were a handful of filmmakers making a really concerted effort. Uh, the People Under the Stairs uh, from the 1980s as well. But there, there still isn't a whole lot. Um, you know, a, a lot of people see uh, the 80s in particular as this very kind of formulaic, cyclical mode of making horror movies. And you mentioned the sort of stereotypical African-American character who shows up only to get eliminated yeah. really quickly. <laughs> and I think that has a lot to do with um, there just isn't a lot of presence of African-Americans writing and producing And that's why I feel there may not be a presence, but similar to, you know, uh, comedies, dramas, and, yeah. you know, the film, me, the film industry is dominated by predominantly um, Caucasians. Oh, sure. That is our responsibility to make sure other races are portrayed as well. We may not, it doesn't have to be a black writer to make sure the protagonist is black or Asian or Hispanic. So to say the more African-American writers or Asian writers we get, the more figures we'll see in this form of literature and movies, it shouldn't be that way. Right. Those should be prevalent regardless because there's a large demographic of Huge. us who watch these movies. Oh, absolutely, and, and that's one thing that's books. always been baffling, um, is there is a huge uh, African-American and Latino audience for horror. Um, from the movies and for the books, and yet you don't see that reflected in what's being produced. And actually, just to ask the cover artist, because you guys would know the covers better than me, did any of you guys ever had a cover where you were asked to paint a, a, a main character or a character of color? I did. You did. Yeah, I have quite a few. Of Vonda McIntyre's story, it was more sci it's science fiction for Eastern Press. One of the characters, I don't remember the story, I painted an African American woman there. And fantasy and science fiction, Mike Resnick, who did a lot of stories about Africa, on the cover of fantasy and science fiction, I did an African American um, uh, tribal, you know, with the tribal gear on. Um, and I did another one. Um, what the story was. I have quite a few. But for, were those Linda for Addison's cover? I just did. Oh right. Were those mostly for magazines? Uh, fancy science fiction magazine. But he did horror too. But these happened to be. Yeah. Um, who wrote that story? Uh, I think it was Mike Resnick again. I seem to get his stuff. But I've done probably more than most people. And I think because I think I do it well. But <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank Addison's you so much book. again. Wonderful presentation. The cover art is remarkable. And Thanks. yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you yeah. so much. No, and it's a good question because you, it really is a disconnect no, between what's true. produced L and I the audience. I just was with Linda a week ago in Tucson, and we yeah. read Sycorax's daughter. They're all African American women uh -huh. writing in this book, and it's up for the um, World Horror. It's yeah. on the ballot too, and she's you should talk to her too. I cool. also think the the enthusiasm with which Get Out has been greeted. Um, really speaks to what you're asking for, and I think it's a pretty signal moment in contemporary cinema, and that um, it has picked something that has been desired for a long time, and I think that that enthusiasm really reflects this kind of like, yes, that's what we've been looking for. So I think that bode, could bode well for the way that horror cinema might develop from that point on. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Um, so just to, Say something about the covers, uh, just sort of about, which is, sounds a little boring after diving into it. But uh, Lisa, can you talk a little about then, Tom was saying the paintings get produced, then can you just talk about the photographing and how they wind up getting well, there? When I, when I did covers, we did, I did sketches or I had sketches given to me. They decided on something and then I would always have them shot, whether it was for Zebra or Bantam or pocketbooks, we would, if, usually if it had people in it, which it always did, we would shoot that. I rented a skeleton so much, I was trying to talk Milton, Milton Charles into buying one, but he wouldn't have it. <laughs> because, as you saw, we, it, everything was something with a, with a skeleton. So then when we'd shoot it, then I would draw, we would, you know, back in that day, 
you'd have to get them printed. They were black and white shots. You'd get them print them up to the size I wanted. Then I would cut them apart or flop them and do whatever I want and then draw from that and then paint it. And then you would bring it into uh, any number of photo houses here and they would shoot the art and reduce it down to, a, to an 8 by 10 transparency, a big giant slide. And then that would go to a separator. And someone, what we do now on a computer, someone would separate those into four colors. And then those would come back and then the art director would look at that and then decide how to fix that, how to finesse that. And then it would go out and then it would come back as, as a cover. Yeah, yeah it's it an insane pain. process. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you mentioned the art directors. And so I wanted to talk to you guys about art directors a little bit. This is um, a Milton Charles sketch, I think, yeah. for the Nestling, yeah. and that's the finished product. Um, can you guys talk, and actually, Mark and Stephanie, we didn't hear from you guys for a bit, but was there an art director you all worked with a lot? And can you give people an idea of what art directors sort of did, like the role they played? Because it's very different. Um, well, when, when, they would bring us in, when they would bring us in, we would uh, talk about the book, or they would just hand us a manuscript sometimes, and we'd go back and read that, or we would get a synopsis from the um, uh, editor, and then come back to, um, in, in a couple of weeks, we'd have a deadline. Unless it was, did you guys work with Vince at, over at Zebra? Oh, no? it's, it's Zebra, yeah. You all did a lot of Zebra covers? Oh, yeah. With, with, with yeah, Vince, um, yeah, you, you'd go to, you couldn't get out of there in less than an hour. You just, a, a, a chatter. Um, but uh, we, then we would come back in a, in, a, in a week or two, depending on what the deadline is, was with, with a few uh, with a few sketches and concepts. But uh, they would really talk about uh, whether you know uh, they wanted a big book feel or or um, you know give us some direction of where it went. But then we would just basically go back and come up with. Steph and I would uh, after reading the book, we'd, we'd brainstorm for a couple of days and and um, come back with sketches and, and concepts, uh, which were usually very rough, not unlike unlike Milton's there, and um, um, yeah. get something approved and go from there. Well, you know, and actually, this is just when you're talking about that, um, this is one of my favorite art director sketches I've ever seen, which is for Tom's fangs. <laughs> uh, that's Jim Plumieri's, right? That's a Jim Plumieri sketch? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's... Was, that was my third painting right after the, uh, the one with the uh, dwarf. Um, uh, yeah, he just sends me this. Um, <laughs> and says, uh, just put a city behind it, and um, you know, it was almost like he said, you know what to do. So uh, I did, I came up to, the, uh, to town here and, with my Polaroid, and took pictures of uh, a cobra at the uh, Museum of Natural History, and then I invited an ex-girlfriend to pose for this one also, and um, it all worked out rather well. I mean, it, it, it was in a series of all those other books in this genre, with the bats and rats and yada yada. Fine. But again, uh, it, it comes to that very simple, classic, clean design and uh, not a cast of thousands. Um, but the painting is lost. That's the thing that really ticked me off. Uh, they were sending it back, but they didn't tell me it was on its way. And uh, I lived in Philly at the time, and two weeks after it was supposed to be there, I just happened to ask them, where is this painting? And they say, oh, we, we already sent it back. So somebody somewhere has this piece. Uh, who knows where? If anyone's in but someone's house. If anybody house sees it on eBay, it. I'd really like to know, because <laughs> I, I like this piece a lot. So. Um, and actually, I was going to say, are you waiting to ask a question? Oh, come on and ask. Let's do it. Well, first, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming, everybody. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. I learned so much. Um, and you know, I, I admire your bravery for reading all those very scary books. And uh, so I hope to see more of your work in the future. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. And I guess I wanted to ask all of you, if any of you, do any of you believe in um, ghosts or ESP or, or vampires or, or things that you have read in the books? Like, has anything that you've read in these books been like, oh, that rings true or something? I don't know, I'm curious. Chad, I think we know your answer. <laughs> No, no, I'm a, I'm a real strict rationalist. I'm, I'm, I'm probably, no, yeah. 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 Although you still got creeped out by these. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Brady. I know, I know, the contradict. Lisa, what about you? I belong to a skeptic society, <laughs> but I, I love the idea of ghosts, and, and, and as my friend Marilyn knows, my house was haunted for a while. Oh, nice. Until I screamed at the top of my lungs at it, and then it stopped. <laughs> Jill? Interesting. 
It's a big question, you know, about spirit. And uh, I feel my father lives here. I mean, after all, I come from him. But I am involved in the psychic world. I'm a numerologist, actually, and I re do people's numbers. And uh, they have meaning and uh, energy. I believe in energy in whatever form it happens to be. Fair enough. Tom? Um, likewise, I feel strongly the family that I have, my mom and dad are gone, but I feel their presence often. Uh, I've referred to the art god forever since college, and he's watched over me um, in crazy ways. I mean, how's, how does a young kid from Pennsylvania, you know, do over 1,200 covers and just because, and still feel as excited about the work now as you ever did back then. But yeah. otherwise, yeah, I think things go bump in the night. Yeah. Mark and Stephanie? So. Well, I, w I won't speak for Steph, but I uh, know I'm pretty much, gr okay. I'm pretty much grounded in science and the real world. Um, which I hope that's, anyway. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I, I still love things that, that, that sleep in the dark and, and uh, you know, the imagination can take you, take you anywhere. Uh, the, um, the, thing, the things that are in the dark are usually a lot scarier than when you turn the, turn the lights on. So it's, uh, it's, it's those things that are fun to think about and speculate, speculate about and draw and uh, try to evoke that kind of, that kind of feeling. But no, I, um, uh, ghosts and um, uh, um, supernatural doesn't really enter into my world. Stephanie, do you? <laughs> well, actually, that brings out something interesting. You're saying the art god. And there is this element in art of inspiration and all these things. And at the same time, you guys were all working in a really commercial market where you were getting things like this. I love that snake <laughs> sketch. I mean, it's just, it's just like, yeah, here's a snake. You know what one looks like. Um, but, you know, where you're getting sort of guidance from what you're producing, but you're also expected to be inspired and bring your own vision to it. Did any of you have a moment with any of a painting you did or a cover you did where it kind of got away from you, where you sort of took it somewhere you weren't expecting, like got inspired as you were doing it, um, caught up in that flow state? Or do you really stick to the man, the remit from the art director? Um, I think when you finally get a few covers under your belt and then you as a young illustrator, you're looking at your mentors in illustration and you're thinking, I want to be the next David Wilcox or Wilson McLean or David Plourd, who were my heroes. Uh, and then you finally get to the point where you don't have to look at how they did a certain thing. You know that you can do it on your own. And that cover that I did called Limbo with my niece, Erin. Oh, I've got it in here. I'll flip for yeah. it in a sec. I don't know. There's something about that. Having this little girl pose for me for so many covers when she was six years old on until she was nearly 40. But when she was so young, she was so excited about it. And yes, I had to do this box coming out of the, coming out of the earth with vines wrapped around it. And she's in the mirror with a cracked glass. And it's like really crazy. But I look at that piece. I've been look, I looked at it last week. And there's just something in her eyes that she was so excited about being there. And that, to bring family into this piece, yeah, I lose myself in that. Yeah. And it's like, okay, get it done by Tuesday, but boy, I'm really enjoying this. So Lisa, you were telling me about one of the big technical challenges of these covers was everyone's favorite step back covers. Um, <laughs> which, uh, and I think Jill, that's your one step back, right? <laughs> Buried Blossoms over there. Yeah. And these are, so Lisa, can you talk a little about like, like how hard were these to do? Well, these, both of these are huge paintings because when I started out, I, I started out doing acrylics and I could only do a three inch head. So that meant you had 21 inch long people whenever you did something. But, uh, you know, the, the system is, for me, the technical part was, uh, you know, just getting a board big enough, getting it, everything, you know, blown up and being able to do put it down and then draw on it. This is uh, my, my niece. I had to find the one thing. You could hire models, but you had to find your own babies. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I, that, I hate that cover. And everyone's like, oh, that I, I, Oh, everyone I, remembers that cover. Right, I know. Unfortunately, probably for all the wrong reasons. I just really, 
I just really, I was looking at that, the actual art the other day, and it was just like, oh man, I oh, really. Oh, that monster's insane. And then I found, and then I was showing, I was showing someone we both know, Darren, he, he there was a, a, I did some anthologies that he had never seen, and to my horror, that was on the, that was on one, one of them, and I went, wait a second, I, I never got paid for that. Yeah, so. <laughs> Well, you know, I've noticed this a few times. I've seen art from a couple of you guys, and I think I saw a piece of yours, Jill, recently used in a foreign market on another. Oh, but yeah. do you guys license sometimes covers oh, yeah. to the foreign? Oh no, market? they steal it. Still? Oh, they steal. It. I had a German agent, this Thomas mm -hmm. Schluck, for many, many years, and he would sell things all over. And I had okay. books, you so know, it's in not every piracy. language, but they do steal it. And that's your only step back. Did you only do one because it was such a pain in the ass to do, or uh, did you just never, no one else ever hired you? I think you? I was coming in on that toward the end of the fad ah, of that. It. And uh, they, yeah, they, they wanted to do it. I, had, I didn't know what the cover was going to be. They were going to work around the art. Read the book and give me a painting. You know, it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I hear all these people talk about art directors giving them sketches. I'm a little envious because it's easier to do when you have someone tell you what to do. I get the manuscript because I'm more of a designer and everything I've done is mine, my right. idea. And of course, the placement, since I was doing it step back, I made sure that I'm telling them what you to cut out right, right. by doing it that way. So they did what they were supposed to do. So two of my favorite step backs are courtesy of Mark and Stephanie. Um, Hobgoblin, which was a oh, uh, uh, Dungeons yeah. and Dragons uh, anti-D&D book. But then probably the craziest step back cover I've ever seen in my life for Sins of the Flesh. Yeah. Who was this for? Actually, everyone should just see how this works. So here's your cover. You got a guy behind the door. And then you yeah. open the book and you get this. <laughs> It is bonkers. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the trick there was really getting the, um, uh, making sure his, his expression or face was yeah. peering through the uh, cellar doors and then having the, um, the hand and trying to work out that anatomy was, was, uh, was interesting. But that, that was one of our favorites just because it's just so much fun to draw things like that. You know, it's, it's um, um, that may have been one of the things I posed for. I don't know. It's who who <laughs> modeled for that? I was just thinking that yeah, it could have been, could have been me. Yeah. It's always my hands. Yeah, it's always it's always Stephanie's hands. Yeah. It's um, but 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 yeah, and then and then and then doing the textures, the different you know the hair and the wood and stuff like that. That was something that Steph always uh, really excelled at. Yeah. With the. Uh, with so, that, so one one thing we talked about a lot was dolls, and these are three of Jill's doll covers. <laughs> You did an awful lot of dolls, Jill. I did, yeah, Harlan Ellison always says to me, another dead doll painting, <laughs> another one. You're not doing a dead doll painting for me, you know, so, he says. So this is, I mean, Chad, you can weigh in on this too. Why so many dolls on these covers? Oh, dolls it's, it's and clowns simple. were, well, dolls and skeletons were everywhere. And skeletons aren't really scary. So skeletons doing activities and dolls are like 60% of horror paperback covers. Why? But that's only after the fact. While we were doing that, I wasn't aware that other people were doing that out there. Right. I, I'm busy on my end here painting dolls because I refuse to put a dead body on a cover. Yeah, I will but, not but, put, that was my reason for using... You think that's why they use dolls? Because right. instead of using a person, yeah, I won't you can use that. like an avatar of a person. Right, exactly. A doll represents a human. And so a doll hanging from a noose. I won't kill a human. I'm yeah. not gonna, you know, unless it's, you know, you just see legs under the bed and the mysteries coming out. You know, right. I won't have a dead body. So dolls are more Represent convenient to mutilate. The, They're more yeah. tasteful. Yeah, yeah. We, makes sense. Uh, we did, this was we did about this sack. story was about a girl hmm? born without a nose. Sack. Well, I'm not going to really? show a little girl without a nose. That's gross. That's disgusting. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing that. And it was a be it's a wonderful, fantastic book. It's a great book. Oh, yeah, but you're right. She has Liz no nose. Liz is incredible, incredible writer. And uh, so yeah, and Garden of Evil. Well, stick a doll's head in it. I'm not putting a human head in it. <laughs> Yeah, chat. It's really interesting, isn't it? Two competing toy armies on either side of town <laughs> can seem so ridiculous, yet a doll isolated can seem so, so uncanny and creepy and difficult to deal with. There's, there's <laughs> complicated. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, someone has a question? Um, I was wondering what was everyone's most difficult job uh, mm. and why? That's yeah. easy. Actually, let's start on this end this time with Mark and Stephanie. 
Boy, most difficult. Um, I think probably the. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking the challenges might have been with. Um, um, I, I, I'm not really sure. I, what? What? Oh. Well, yeah, you know, actually, the, the, one, of the, one of the reasons we really like doing horror is that it was because of, of things like this. You don't have to do a likeness when you're punching a doll in the face, it's, uh, which I, I love this cover, too. Uh, <laughs> but um, we, we, outside, outside of the horror and outside of paperbacks, it was when we got into having to do, uh, for me, it was either beautiful people, which would be a romance. I mean, our romances were just horrible. I always had to rely on Steph for, to make what I did attractive. But then doing likenesses was, uh, was a, a, a real, uh, doing a likeness in a way that was flattering was, was for, for me personally, was one of the most mm -hmm. difficult. And actually, can I interrupt for a second? Lisa, that was something you talked about, making people look attractive on covers. And you talked about flopping their faces. Well, can apparently just... I'm the only person up here who did that. But when we did covers, so, that, so, so it would look formal and straight, because you're, you're in a 4x7 format, if I was just doing a face, I would always shoot the person, take, the, take two photographs, take one flopped, then you cut them in half and you see which two halves look better, because people's face are not symmetrical. So in order to have a pleasing cover when you're doing a face, I would just take the two good halves and stick them together That's and then so cool. work from there. <laughs> Tom, most difficult job? Uh, I'm struggling with this, but um, looking back, the ones that seemed to be the most difficult were the ones where the concept that was being driven by the pub house just didn't feel there at all. Yet you were, they were buying your hands to do the work, so you had to go ahead and do it. And I, one had many dead bodies and a guy standing with a rifle that just didn't feel quite right, and I just couldn't quite get there, and uh, that was one project, but I'm sure there were many, many. Did you, did you execute it or change it? Yeah, I, I did it. And uh, I know the art director wasn't happy with it either because he wasn't happy with the concept either. I think he was being pushed in that direction too. It was one of those deals. Yeah. Uh, two young guys that just didn't have any power, so we had to do what was being told to us. So. Jill, toughest job? It's not that the job is difficult. It's sometimes you're dealing with, it's art by committee. It's not just you. I had done uh, a Ramsey Campbell book, Incarnate. I had been given like four or five of these to do. And uh, that was the first. And I did a sketch. I did a color comp. They approved it. I did the painting. I bring it in. And I get into a room of suits, men in suits. And there they are. It's corporate. It's marketing. It's the bookseller. Barnes and Noble's there. They're all there. These corporate people are there. This one says, I think I would make that blue sky more purple. I think I would do this. I'd take the shadow out or do this. Or do... And all of them were standing. I was sitting there and I said, whoa, I'm going home now. When you decide what you want, call me. And I left. <laughs> they never touched a thing. I won't put up with that nonsense. But that's what happens behind the scenes. Remember, before we get a manuscript, it has been through just an edit, uh, the, before the editing process, the, purchasing process to say we'll yeah. take it, the editing process, the how we're going to market this thing, where it's going to go, its genre, its placement. They didn't know what to do with Charlie Grant. Yeah. It wasn't quite horror. It wasn't quite fantasy, so they called it dark fantasy. Fine. Okay. So all this goes on, and then we get it last. They've lived with this for months or years or whatever, suddenly to come and you know, solve their problem, <laughs> which is the face of the book. And so we come to this, and... They have notions, they just do. The preconceived notions they yeah. don't always tell you about, and now you're bringing them something they have, you know, they see a sketch and have to come up with something, but they have to have a say. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, toughest? Well, for me, a lot of them were tough where I had to, had to do, like, make things not real, real. And I think I told you the story of one time having dinner with Milt out, and we were, he was doing a book called Brotherly Love about murderous twins. And after two or three drinks, I said, Rorschach. You have a Rorschach, and you have the people coming out of the Rorschach. And he went, brilliant. And then the next day, I woke up and went, oh, my God, what the fuck? You know? And, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, so 
I, I saw the painting the other day when I was up in my attic, and I was like, yeah, okay, but if you, if you see the paint, I, I actually have the, uh, the, the cover. They, they went all out with, like, you know, gloss and this or that, so you don't see all these little, you know, s sinews of, of right. these people pulling out. So it was all for nothing. <laughs> well, you, oh, yeah, go ahead, Chad. I, I, I'm really interested in this making the unreal real, this style of really realistic and naturalistic painting. Um, I think it's really awesome and really cool, and I don't see it very much anymore today in book design. And I'm curious, is, is there a correspondence between the end of the sort of classic era of the horror novel, 1996, and a move away from these kind of really naturalistic uh, styles of painting and design on, on covers? I, I think that when they, they've, I just was in something called a LuxCon, and it's, it, it's 80 fantasy science fiction painters, and they just go and they have a four day sell, they bring all their paintings and they sell. I think they're still out there. I don't think, I don't think they're on covers anymore. I just think they've gone and gone to another, you know, the art's now just like on the web or you just sell the paintings or it's now called magical realism. So that's where I think a lot of it's gone to. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you've taught before though when digital came in, how much it changed your, your work. Um, what did you want to? Well, he was just saying sort of this idea of suddenly you could, people could make things photorealistic without having so mm -hmm. much of an art background. And oh, art yeah. directors lost a lot of power in that era and sales and marketing came up. And that sort of all coincided with digital coming in. And I know you've talked about that sort of change some. Well, for myself, I felt rather fortunate to have 15, 20 years of traditional behind me when things went digital. The learning curve happened very quickly and suddenly I was able to uh, do things I could never do in the past, yet using the sensibility of a painter, you could still twist the digital in that direction. Like, I wouldn't have to spend three days rendering grass. You know, it's done in two, two three minutes. Yeah. Same with the clouds and sky. But um, to me, it's been a godsend in that regard. The downside is the impact it's had on publishing and the people that are the movers and shakers or the decision makers and like every project I do now, I'm giving in seven or eight renderings or versions of a similar image, whether it's different sky, different treatment, position, boom, boom, boom. It's endless, just endless. Back then, you do a sketch, uh, like the Jim Plumeri Fang sketch, you know, you get that, then I give him a rendering or just a sketch of my outline of my painting. And he'd get that approved and do the painting, boom, you're done. Pretty much, you know, unless something was drastically wrong, that was it. Yeah. And you move on to the next one. Granted, it took three weeks or so. And now you can do them in a couple of days if you have to. But, right. you know. Well, Mark, you went with digital, right? You really embraced did, yes. digital mm -hmm. technology. What was it about it that you really liked? I... I guess I've always been a little fascinated with the technical part. I think I did the, we, um, the first uh, digital cover we did was in, I th I, we, Steph and I were talking about this on the way down, I think, I think it was 89 or 90. On a, it was done on a Mac SE uh, on, on, on an ad agency's computer. I had a friend who was a tech uh, person in the, in the ad agency and she basically let us stay there overnight and, and create this cover. But, it didn't really, for, for me, I mean, I, I was nervous about turning in paintings that were digital like that. So I actually coined a term which uh, I, I thought might make art directors a little bit more comfortable. I called it tradigital art. <laughs> and uh, because, because the technology even then, with uh, there was a program called uh, Color Studio, which was almost a um, um, precursor to Photoshop. And uh, the same company that did Color Studio did uh, Fractal Painter. And when Painter came out, I think, I think by the, the mid or the early 90s, I was doing, I was pretty much totally digital with, with the stuff. Yeah. And, they, and they, they could, what they can do with the, with the, um, um, with the technology, well, the brushes and the naturalistic brushes that they made were just, were just amazing. The, um, the thing that really helped was, was not so much in creating it because it was still painting and drawing. I, I, I still even start, start off drawing on a tracing pad. But um, it was the changes that came later because you could do so many things on layers, and if they need a new background or something changed or something moved, uh, resized, it just became a lot easier to, to do. Yeah. 
Um, one thing also is you guys, I mean, you use models and reference a lot. I mean, some, some more than others and all that. But one thing I wanted to talk about really quickly is, Lisa, we've got um, a couple of models up there. Uh, is that you on Inhuman? Yes, that's, that's, that's me. <laughs> Why did you wind up using yourself? Because uh, we, I had hired a model, and she she couldn't she couldn't she couldn't do this, and so <laughs> you know some people just can't use their hands, and so finally I I just said you know forget it forget it, and then you know I just had the photographer shoot me, and you know there I am for posterity. <laughs> and that's another one of your nieces or nephews. Uh, actually, actually, no, that was I think we were able to come down with a a baby that time, but. Uh, I did have I did buy a fish, you know. Of course, fish scales aren't that big, but right. you know, brought it home, photographed it, and you know, got all the uh, all the you know the seaweed, and then did that one. Actually, I really like that's one of my favorite paintings. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then uh, you were just talking about limbo, Tom, yeah. over there. And then that's it's Aaron, right? Aaron, yeah. So yeah, and then how old is she on limbo? Um, on Limbo, I think she's nine. On this one here, she was six or seven. That's Richard Page was actually a Dean Koontz cover. And then, and that's her also that's right her there. Also. Yeah, and, that's, and, and you kept painting her as she grew up. That's right. Yeah. That's um, Aaron on all of those. It is. Yeah. How old do you with like for Last of the Amazons? Um, she was, uh, she, I think, twenty-five. I mean, it's kind of amazing that this kid grows up yeah. on these bookstore shelves, yeah. and, and no one knows that it's happening. It's quite a family album. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> they have these pieces hung in their houses and stuff. Uh, I mean, this one here, the uh, Jennifer Vanderbee's cover, I just absolutely love this project, because that was all produced within 24 hours. Oh, really? Re reference gathering, everything from yeah. the dress that was found in New Hope at a, uh, my wife happened to be shopping down there in a vintage store, found it. Um, the bird was found at a Zern's farmer's market just a half hour away from us. The bird uh, cage was uh, my parents, again, half hour away. Took all the photos that night and by 24 hours later, two o'clock to two o'clock, uh, again, for Jim Plumeri, in this yeah. case, we had a finished piece, and he showed this piece to his people, and they thought it was from the archives of some, <laughs> some you know, uh, uh, deep yeah. archives. And he said, no. Nah, and it's, it's Aaron also, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Aaron. Yeah. Um, one last question. Yeah. Uh, okay, I do have a question, but I wanted to make a quick comment in response to what you asked about why so many dolls and clowns, and my answer, in my opinion, is they are creepy. They can be very creepy. <laughs> I mean, especially if you're a child. I can, re you know, Twilight Zone episode with um, Cliff Robertson, the ven ventriloquist, and his dummy oh. takes over. <sighs> and also the one with um, Tally Savalas and Taki Tina, yeah. who killed him. <laughs> That, so I think they're pretty creepy. Anyway, but my question is, when you create your original artwork, do you uh, own the copyright? Is it considered intellectual property? I mean, yeah, we own the rights. Yeah. Um, so if, it's ever, if ever anyone uses it or... They buy second rights, third rights, whatever. Yeah. Or they steal it. <laughs> Although it used to be that you guys, I mean, in the early days, just sold the painting to the publisher. You didn't sell it. They kept it. They kept them. Right, right. And then, well, someone was telling me that the reason they started just licensing first serial rights from artists is they just didn't have the room to store the paintings right, anymore. Right, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so you guys, it's all just licensing, right? Yes. I yeah. own all my own. We sell first rights, is that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. First, one-time publishing rights. Right. They're not buying art. They're buying the right to use the art. <laughs> so it's not a gallery. Right. Right. So I just want to say before we sort of wrap up, because I know we're sort of at the end of the time, if people just want to talk about, is there an artist or someone uh, who influenced you who you think is not as well known as they should be? Uh, and actually, Chad, jump in, because I mean, is there a, a director or a filmmaker or someone who you also think you know, is huge and is not well known as they should be? I just want to get some names out there for people, because there's so many people, especially who worked in horror, who've been forgotten. Artists also. I, I was excited to see Niederman's pin in the book. I love the movie oh. pin. Um, I it's feel a good like movie. It's, it's kind of criminally overlooked, um, um, creepy ventriloquism film. Um, 
Uh, Another doll. And I, I, yeah. I, I have a list now to, to read of, <laughs> of, of yeah. things that I, I feel have been overlooked that you've brought out for us as well. So that, that's cool. good. Uh, Lisa, an artist or, or someone do you think really has been overlooked and is kind of a giant in the field? There are a lot of illustrators from like the 50s and the 60s that are, you know, when, you, when I came in, I, I would be like, oh, this is so dated. But, you know, the Roger Castells, everybody knows Roger Castell from Jaws, you know, right. but he, he did a ton of book covers. There was this man I, I tried to get to meet and could never meet, and uh, his work is unbelievably beautiful. Bill Edwards, do you remember him from the 60s? I, if you went into Bantam, if you went into Bantam, they had all his, they had his art, and it was all up on the, uh, all up on the walls, and I just go in there, and I go, oh my God, this, and uh, Milton Charles tried, uh, he had a, a big show of uh, the fine art of illustration in Hunterdon County at the Hunterdon Art Museum, and we tried like crazy to track him down to get some of his work, and we never could, but there are many illustrators out there that just, like, you know, who are these people? They, they right. come in for a couple of years, they don't sign their work, and then they, they disappear. Yeah. Jill? Yeah, no, it's true. A lot of them didn't sign their work, so people uh, don't know who they are. But, you know, when it comes to books and writing, they're promoting the author. We know that. I mean, they want to cover because that might be a selling point if it's a first-time novel or an unknown <laughs> author, so they want a very good cover. Yet Stephen King, you write his name, you can have a spot, you can have nothing. It doesn't matter because you're buying Stephen King. And so once they reach that level, it doesn't matter. Right. And there are so many artists out there, unless they are out there. I, I've been going to conventions for years and years and years. And, you know, they get to know you, see you. There's an art show. But that's when you have a genre with fandom, which science fiction had. I was unique in doing horror in there and bringing it in, as others did. Even Michael Whalen had Lovecraft covers. And they're brilliant and they're wonderful. But he's known for his high fantasy science fiction work. He's brilliant. And I got to know all these people, meet the editors, meet the publishers, and I got work that way. And I'm, I marvel that to <laughs> these two, who I've known their work forever, and they've known mine, we never met because they didn't go to conventions, right? And there I am, schmoozing with everybody, you know. I just came back from Tucson at Tuscan, real fa 44, it's the 44th year this year was that convention. And if you get yourself out there, but then there are the artists who don't. And Walter Velez, who I've represented for all these years, who did all the Thieves World covers, the Myth covers, and a zillion covers out there, they don't know them. Right. Because he doesn't, nobody ever met him. They don't believe he exists. They say, I'm, I do them and sign his name. Or Richard Bober, who's incredible work, he's a recluse. He doesn't come out. You yeah. know, there's people like that. A lot of recluses we had, you know, for sure. Tom? Well, yeah, I've spent a lot of time in my fortress of solitude, as Paolo <laughs> will attest to here, that yeah. I don't come to New York very often, but it feels really good to be here. Um, I guess I look at my influences when I was a young illustrator in the 70s, uh, Don Ivan Punchans, uh, Kim Whitesides, Dave Wilcox, David Plourd especially, he became a dear friend. Um, he uh, started showing up on TV guide covers with the Waltons and I wrote to him. He was with Pema Brown, uh, his reps, and uh, he was kind enough to uh, meet me here in the city uh, when I came up with a class trip from Kutztown and uh, we then became friends. He lived in Warwick, New York and um, he was like the person that, uh, he was like the Jim Plumeri on the artist side. He was the guy that I would go to and he would answer all my questions and guide me in that regard. But his work was phenomenal. He was just a very strong technician, very clean, simplistic, um, things lost in shadow were just lost in shadow, but the way he did it was beautiful and graphic. And uh, yeah, if you can find his work, it's, it's they're real studies to check out. Stephanie, Dave, or Mark? I, um, I guess I was more influenced by the emotion of artists like Geiger, who did um, Alien, and a man named, a German artist named Gottfried Helnwein. Um, there are there the emotions that they put into things and the, the way that they twisted 
reality was a little horrific, but at the same time, very attractive. So I always really liked those emotions put together. Yeah, she's weird. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the year before we came out uh, from, from Idaho and moved, moved out to New, uh, New York, we, um, we went to a, um, an illustrator's workshop that uh, it was in Terrytown. We spent, we were out here for about uh, three weeks. It was our first experience with New York and the East at all. But uh, the workshop was run by six of the top artists at the time. Um, among them were uh, Bob Peake, um, Alan Kober, Mark English, Bernie Fuchs. These were huge, huge people. Sorry. Yes, Otnis, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, huge in the 60s and 70s. They did uh, advertising and editorial and just amazing artists that, that, uh, that really, all, all unique in their own, uh, with their own medium, uh, but just masters of it. And uh, we had, um, I, I think we were with them for two weeks, was it a week or two weeks? I can't remember, but it was a, it was a phenomenal uh, experience to um, uh, to get under our belt to, to, to be able to talk to talk with these with these people and um, see their see their art and and go with them to create things uh, we the, one of the it was it was supposed to be a workshop for illustrators but uh, and Bob Peak did the, did the last one he's he did the apocalypse now poster uh, some of the Star Trek um, illustrations uh, po movie posters uh, he, he brought us in, uh, it, I think it was one of the last, the last days, and he just said, basically, we're just going back to basics, and he just did a basic drawing class that was just, just amazing. Um, I had a chance to go with Alan Kober, who does pen and ink stuff, and we, we went to um, um, a place, it was, it was further up, up the Hudson, but it was a place where people are effectively put away, and he did a lot of his drawings. They're very quirky, very... Um, really strong pen and ink drawings, but, but um, they, they just really capture kind of some of the twisted um, physical characteristics of, of, of people that, uh, it, it was, it was just, a, just an amazing experience. So for me, that was it. Yeah. All right, I think we are out of time. Thank you guys all for coming, but especially thank these guys. This book wouldn't exist without them.